Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being back on time. I hope you had an enjoyable evening yesterday, and especially the reception after the meeting. This morning, we will start with the feedback sessions from the side meetings held on Monday, uh, and we have eight of them. And I will kindly ask Nigel Smith and Marine Bordin to start with the first group on cabin safety. So if you could join us here on stage, please. Morning. I don't know whether you were elected or whether you volunteered for doing the presentation, but thanks anyway for being so brave to be the first one today to do the presentation. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nigel Smith, SWS Certification Services, and my uh, colleague here, Maroon Bordas of Weir Engineering. <laughs> Didn't memorize that one. And we're here to uh, present a summary for the cabin safety side meeting. The main points of discussion are uh, 16G seats, um, especially around HIC variations. Uh, in the context of what level of design changes require a new test, classification of changes involving seat hit compliance, uh, the various uses of similarity, component level testing, uh, especially in uh, the context of ARP 6330. Next point was flammability and fire protection. Uh, subject of accreditation of test laboratories and data usage. And uh, we were advised uh, by one of our RIASA colleagues um, that there's information in the upcoming J News for that. There was a lot of discussion around lithium batteries, um, not just the, uh, the inherent fire issues, but also around the means of isolation, protection, uh, storage, that sort of stuff and also the AC2178 usage on surrogate panels. And again, this is also addressed in the summer version of the J News article. Next was classification of layout of changes. There is a proposed certification memorandum on the classification of design changes in the cabin safety domain. And uh, Marin will explain the action that's come out of that one. There's changes to, changes to CS 562 seats will all be major changes with a few exceptions. So that's obviously uh, quite a debate. Also, there was a discussion around uh, 365, rapid decompression to be considered, uh, and the applicable requirements, especially in the first class, business class uh, cabin configurations where you have mini suites and other side furniture. Seat installation requirements specific to product types, and that's type certificate holder, frame spec availability on some annexes to the uh, type certificate data sheets. There is a reference to um, an Airbus uh, frame spec, I don't think there's any on, um, on Boeing, but basically so that we, you know, we as DOAs can identify where uh, certain information is going to be held. Access to that information and data referenced in the type certificate data sheet 
especially areas uh, involving special conditions, being able to gain access to them, uh, equivalent safety findings, and other type certificate holder documents, again, frame specs. One of the concerns brought up is that it's very, very difficult, unless you can get a hold of these frame specs, to be able to identify what the in-flight ground and ground loads are. Uh, the action identified uh, for industry is to develop uh, the industry experience and competence in the context of the LOI to reduce uh, agency involvement on subsequent projects, uh, to assist agency into implementing a level playing field on the classification CM uh, futures update by providing cases, uh, to participate and comment uh, NPI and published uh, special conditions. Uh, and the way to provide uh, concise and clear certification programs. What did work well? Uh, first of all, the av availability of uh, all the concerned uh, EASA experts, uh, <coughs> the hospitality of the agency, as always. Um, STC and GNews uh, is recognized as helpful. Um, EASA plan to include uh, TC order frame specs extract into TCDS annexes with proper consideration to uh, IP rights. Uh, easy access to regulation and certification specification and possible extension to CRE. Issues and concerns. So, <laughs> the re readability of some complex TCDS. Uh, so, we had an example uh, of Airbus family, but don't be jealous uh, if there are boring people here. Uh, it's quite the same for boring TCDS. Uh, so it's difficult to determine the certification basis, uh, reading only the TCDS. Um, the TCDS reference data uh, not being easily visible. Uh, there are uh, some TCDS without annexes, uh, and some of them are not regularly updated. Uh, we had another point on unavailability of TCDS mentioned data. Uh, for example, orange paper uh, and some jar documents uh, are not easy to find them. Um, flight and ground load factors should be added uh, to the TCDS annexes. Uh, the use of general notification facilities versus ever changing years a side page uh, URL changes and overall the um, website uh, user friendliness could be improved. This is a picture of our group. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. What I think what is, is really good from these side meetings, even though you are competitors in business, I think uh, you come together to share your experience. Uh, and as you've seen the topics, uh, you all face the same issues and try to find together with us uh, how do you best can address it. And I think that's really one of the real benefits of these side meetings. Coming to the next group, and I have to check my Yeah, that's the group Airlines and Dagmar Elton and Peter Duhl from KLM. Please. Forward, backward, if you want to point to something. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity that we can share some thoughts we put together during our side meetings of the airlines. Um, also, the airlines group was a group I'm, I'm attending 
every year since the beginning, and still there, are, there is one person uh, in that group who was also uh, start, uh, from there from the beginning, so it, it's, well, it's long time. Um, uh, we ha are happy to have this uh, group because uh, there are a lot of discussions were internally to discuss some items we, see, we, um, we have in, in our organizations. And we had a very good exchange of issues and praxis. Um, the group uh, is that, <laughs> um, several airlines, and uh, we um, sat down and thought about what would, uh, went well during that group, this open and honest discussions, a good participation, and uh, we changed the agenda several times, so it, uh, it, we were quite flexible, like always. Um, uh, we had all experts we need, Thank you for that, and uh, yeah, the supporting moderation was very good, thanks, as well. Um, issues we found out is that uh, we had some, uh, some items the last years, and uh, there is no follow-up, and we propose uh, that uh, next year, in the beginning, we would, uh, uh, EASA might show us follow-ups from their side, and we can share these items. Yeah, and now I you. give to Peter. Um, we discussed uh, several uh, topics. Um, we selected a few of them uh, to make the list not too long. Uh, we discussed uh, compliance demonstration by similarity, uh, repair approvals from non-TC holder OEMs, uh, generic repairs, EPA marking, for one reissue after STC approval. <coughs> um, we note therefore the compliance demonstration by similarity that show compliance. Uh, using similarity as uh, compliance demonstration is very dependent on the type of project that you have. Um, one DOA reported that they got an uh, audit, audit finding by their DOA uh, team leader uh, when using compliance demonstration by similarity, although it was previously accepted by the PCM, where other DOAs use similarity uh, often for compliance demonstration and don't have any problems with that. Um, so we've noted that there is no equal level playing field for all EASA DOAs. Um, further, we would like to recommend uh, DOAs, especially airline DOAs, to have a library of previous TC holder approvals that can be used uh, as substantiation for uh, shuttle compliance by similarity for future repairs. Um, the repair approvals for, from non-TC holder OEMs uh, were discussed. Um, one airline uh, had the topic of an uh, OEM that provided, that, uh, that installed a repair on a component. Uh, the OEM was a, uh, what we call a second level of design authority from the TC holder, so it's like a subcontractor from the TC holder. Um, and the previous aircraft owner accepted these repairs. Uh, and that previous owner was a non-EU uh, operator uh, from a country that had without bilateral agreement with EASA. So it was for, and when that aircraft was uh, introduced into uh, EU registration, that it was difficult to approve these, to accept these designs. Uh, so EASA is requested to accept minor changes and repairs from all proper, properly regulated authorities, and not only from USA, Canada, and Brazil, for example, from Singapore. discussed uh, generic uh, repairs for a type certificate. Uh, uh, these are usually developed if damages occur more often to support maintenance. And they are acceptable if the repair is clearly defined with its applicability and limitation. Um, EASA 
it's request, uh, EASA's position is requested for consistency by all DALIT team leaders, for example, providing a document with within the frequently asked questions. Our good old friend EPA marking. Um, well, we discussed lengthy the um, sense and nonsense of this uh, issue. <laughs> And uh, we have, uh, we encountered already uh, still a different interpretation of this marking requirements. Just, it, we just talked about the EPA, the European Parts Approval marking on the parts, not on, about others, mark, uh, other marking requirements. Uh, and uh, we, are, we have the opinion that uh, there is no level, no level playing field with FAA and uh, we do not see safety, increased safety by this requirement and we would therefore very much, uh, very much request EASA to, to re-evaluate this, uh, this requirement and uh, to really to look at the safety benefit of that. <laughs> Then we had uh, another issue, which is also a lengthy issue. There is a, on the web page a good uh, first installation of an STC by a ma maintenance organization. This is a good praxis, which is nice to have. But there is also one point, which is um, nasty, <laughs> uh, that uh, after, the, after all parts, all prototype parts, which are installed into an aircraft, during the prototype STC, first installation of the STC, um, uh, they are not, they are installed with prototype or not proved. And uh, after STC issue, some MO, uh, um, some NAAs uh, ask the, the maintenance organization that all these parts do have to show a re release certificate as approved, which is, which delays the uh, delivery of the aircraft um, for several days or several weeks. Um, and some we can't get from the States. There is another requirement. And so we will stay here after this, after this uh, conference and cannot go back because the aircraft is sitting on the ground. Um, so therefore we would ask EASA to take a similar approach as the FAA or uh, to find other means to overcome this disadvantage. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to meet and this is our group and have a good day. Thanks Peter, thanks Dagmar. You had some interesting topics. Uh, I think we need to follow up internally. Uh, thanks for raising that. I think that is a good opportunity also for us to see where we can improve and, and things were not working maybe as they should. To find pragmatic ways to improve. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Thanks a lot. The next group is the General Aviation Group, and we have Marco Festa, who is going to do the presentation. Good morning, everybody. I'm here, I'm Marco Festa from Airplus company, and I'm here to present the results of the side meeting uh, of the group three about general aviation. 
We have two main points of discussion. The first point of discussion was the CS23 Amendment 5, the implementation and the exchange of experience. And the second one is the LOI concept implementation inside the general aviation company. The first one I think is uh, really interesting because this is the first aircraft level performance uh, safety objective based certification specification of EASA. And we are, let's say, the first one trying to work with that. And we found some issues. The first issue we found is correlation between ASTM and CS25, uh, 23, sorry, objective. This is uh, clear, of course, in the AMC that EASA gave to us. But the point is who performs this work of correlation between the requirements, the safety objectives, and the ISTM and the compliance material. We have to change the design assurance system to cope with the new structure of the CS23 because, of course, we have no more performance-based requirement but safety objectives. And therefore, we need to define, for example, the responsibility of the uh, function, company function, that makes the translation between the safety object, uh, objectives and the acceptable means of compliance. That for those who do not know are now the performance-based requirements, more or less. So we have defined the need, perhaps, to change the design assurance to cope with this new safety-based regulation. The point is also the independent verification of compliance against the applicable ASTM made by the CVE. So should we do the independent verification of compliance with the CVE on the safety object objectives and on the ASTM acceptable means of compliance or only on the safety objectives? Because the point is now for us, the acceptable means of compliance contains all the technical requirements. Use of different ASTM revision. We discuss also that because uh, especially in the future, we will have the CS23 Amendment 5 that will remain the same and the ASTM revision running up. So in the future, there may be uh, not, not an issue, but the, the point to control the ASTM revision in order to understand which a ASTM was used for each TCDS. And then the, for the STC and the changes, the definition of the certification basis and of the means of compliance. Because of course the CS23 will remain the same, what change will be the acceptable means of compliance. And so how we could identify the acceptable means of compliance perhaps in the certification basis or in the aircraft documentation. The second topic we discussed about was the LOI implementation. Uh, so the, uh, it was presented the DOA policy on the LOI implementation. We uh, review and we discuss the draft certification program template that is on the EASA internet site, uh, that will be on the EASA uh, internet. And we have the implementation of the LOI in practical application. We discuss how to implement that, also uh, taking into account the dimension of the companies that normally are not so big, and so how, how is more efficient to implement the LOI in small DOAs and small, let's say, sm small companies that has normally not a so big, such a big number of a worthiness engineer. Then uh, the point is benefit versus cost. It's a huge amount of work. Normally in general aviation company, we have two to three worthiness engineer and it's all work for the worthiness engineer. So it's really a benefit for lower end general aviation to have the effort to define the level of involvement and to propose the level of involvement and then to have them accepted, counting also on the fact that normally we work with uh, known PCM, we work with sometimes with the 
NAA uh, people that are still working since 20, 30 years with the general aviation companies, and so we know what they want to see, they know what they want to see from us, so why we have then to make the risk analysis, the safety analysis, just to receive back a feedback that says, well, perhaps no, <laughs> we want to see what we have seen already in the past for similar projects, and then what about the Part 21 proportionality in regards to the LOI? So we would be interested to see the proportionality of the Part 21 also in regards, let's say, project-based and connected to the LOI. The action identified, we identified some action on the CS23 Amendment 5 we ask EASA to provide a clear correlation between ASTM and CS23 objectives with also explanation, if possible, of the scope of what they want to see. Because now we just have a number and another number on the side. That's difficult to, uh, to, to make interpretation. Make, it's difficult to interpret it. About the LOI implementation, we ask and will be very helpful for us, especially also in, let's say, with the aim of classification, to have the possibility to publish a list of the standard CRI. Not perhaps with the contents, but just a list of the ASA with all the requirements that says, here we have a CRI generally on that topic, here we have a CRI generally on that topic, and this is a problem that we think is not only of general aviation, it's a general problem because you discover the CRI just after you made the application. And then, in general, we ask IASA to provide more general aviation-related uh, technical training center workshop. We remember a 2017 general aviation structural workshop that was really helpful for us, and therefore we are asking IASA to provide more of this technical training and workshop for the industry because we think that we can have really an improvement uh, in, inside our way of working, because it was a really good confrontation with the other on technical topic, it was really clear, and we defined it, the way to proceed on a lot of, let's say, known or unknown issues. What did work well? Uh, we have the participation of the right person, from EASA for the different topics in agenda, and I want to thank uh, really much EASA for the people that join our group. They give us really a good support, really good technical advices. It was a really good stakeholder mixture, different companies, different experiences to share, so we really exchange a lot of interesting idea, and it was an open and constructive exchange of experience. We encounter uh, inside the organization basically no issue, and the other things that we want to highlight was already highlighted during the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. group is uh, Stefan Boussour and Armin Kaiser. And we mentioned it already yesterday, competence. Uh, I think that's quite an interesting topic because it's, we all fight for the same resources to keep competences, to attract competences. And let's see what your discussion brought. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So it's uh, tool presented by Frank Kaiser, not Armin Kaiser, which is a pre <laughs> which was a Frank, Frank. Armin Kaiser was a previous PCM. <laughs> so the competence. Competence it's a high uh, critical subject. The challenge is what we should ensure the continued competence of uh, people, of the DOA, 
so that uh, we at the end the product maintain uh, the right quality and the right performance. The issue and the, the difficulty is competence is a quite a classic word. There is a lot of uh, definition behind, but there is no unique model for all the way, and that's the challenge. This is maybe a reason why there is no dedicated guidance. Difficult to, to uh, promote one recommendation or one model where there is not a one size fits all. So, in addition, all the DOA holders have shown their capacity to manage the competence. They have all qualified people at the right place with the right means. We did not address here with uh, the resource issue, the number of people, which is another uh, problematic. So having said that, why would we need more? Why do we need to discuss about competence? In fact, and the challenge is that we need to prepare the future. We will face a lot of new generation, new people. We lose a lot of experienced people. Then we need to have this transfer of knowledge. We we'll have to face with new technology. Are we sure we are competent for the technology of today? Will we be competent for tomorrow? New regulation, which is also uh, an issue. You have seen that we have a lot of new regulation which come into place. For such a new regulation, how could we claim to be competent when we have the first time to deliver the product? So there's a lot of subjects. So we have a lot of topics to discuss, and this is the, the result. The main point of discussion are, so here it's a lot of uh, subjects, there is a lot of uh, redundancy, but still uh, focusing on competence. The first uh, problematic is how to define the competence. How should we measure it? Should we measure the individual, or is the competence is measured through the quality of the deliverable? How to cope with this evolution, the technology, the uh, regulatory uh, evolution, as I said previously, or the model should adapt to cope this capacity to measure the competence right first time. We cannot wait five years of making a trial to be competent to show the compliance to the first time we have to comply uh, with the change with the new regulation. We have to adjust, typically, the case of the problematic of the cybersecurity. You could be competent today, but you need to maintain, adjust your competence so that tomorrow you will still be capable to comply with this uh, regulation. The question also, one of the uh, complexity is how to acquire competence when you do not have it available in-house, whereas it's required. Having a flight test engineer qualified to make a CV, yeah, it's, a, it's an issue. You, a lot of companies does not have all the competence required for any kind of change, although they are part of a term of approval in terms of capacity. Which kind of competence is required? Okay, we have an assessment when we are making a design change, but here it's, uh, so you must be competent to deliver, uh, get an approval of a change. The next challenge is, with regard to the obligation, you have to secure the criteria worthiness. So you need to be competent today to make a change, but you need to maintain this competence to ensure your obligation for criteria of worthiness for 30 years. Are we sure that all of us are uh, capable to maintain this competence for such a long time? And finally, what should be also, uh, when we are dealing with competence, we are dealing also with human resources, so a lot of uh, soft skills. What should be also the interface between the technical uh, design office and our customer services and the human resource department? Here we must have a strong synergy with the human resource internally to be sure that uh, the recruitment is not limited, uh, or the competence is not limited only on hard skill, on technical skill, but also on soft skill. The soft skill is uh, of good importance. An individual could be very competent, but if he's not well engaged, the deliverable will not be. So, lot of to topic, lot of question, not a unique solution. Nevertheless, we still achieve a few conclusions. So a consensus, that yes, we have to be careful, competence is not limited to CV. The first competence that all the DOA have is the capacity to design, not the capacity to make an independent check only. And also, uh, measuring the competence from classroom uh, solution, through years of experience, of number of projects that uh, each individual has follow, 
might not be on their own sufficient. Yes, it could be a element, but nevertheless, it's not, uh, as we say, one size fits all, it's not the, the result. And then, pass to your, the action, ah, so some action identified, yes, because after that I will pass to, to Frank for the group recommendation, because we speak a lot, but we will give you a nice recommendation. So uh, we need to develop further guidance or best practice to show that, that this kind of best practice should be shared to facilitate the DOA management of competence on the topic identified. Here again, as we said at the beginning, there is no two unique model, but nevertheless, the way to manage the competence, the way to maintain this competence can be uh, standardized. And uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, during the side meeting discussion. We ha you will have some backup slides to give uh, you some more detail. And also, uh, we publish a group recommendation. What was good also that uh, we have a no other part from the other participation, we have a leader of the uh, OASA team working in, in terms of competence. The OASA is working on its own competence modeling, competence assessment, and the first pilot case is on the certification directorate. So here, again, it's for having a measurement of the model of the resource of, uh, and competence of the certification directorate. In the industry, we'll face the same problematic, so here we could find synergy. And also, we have an ISD uh, working group, an initiative from the DOA Think Tank, we're dealing on working group 13 on competence, which has started. So it's, it's still not finished. We are just at the beginning to assess. We, we came together. We are at the middle of a river. And uh, this year, we, in 2020, the objective is to d d deliver this preliminary draft. So any many people who want to share the experience or to join the group is welcome. And then finally, the gift, the group recommendation. So I'll leave the floor to Frank for the final uh, slide. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Stefan. Uh, we chose to do a double, uh, a dual uh, presentation because we had a group, a diverse group. Uh, Stefan representing uh, his company Airbus, but of course also the, the li larger group. There were also smaller DOAs, some uh, even one with a. Uh, one head of design who was the expert and some engineers with a lot of less competence. So we decided to, to have also the view of the, the smaller uh, DOAs uh, represented in this competence uh, discussion. Uh, we had a little trouble getting, in the morning at least, getting uh, the question on the table. What, what is the direction that we want to discuss? And that's also, I think, um, representative for the competence topic. It's a very large, broad topic where everybody is probably struggling with. Uh, uh, also good to know is that um, it is mostly industry that is uh, driving this discussion. It is not EASA who is asking for more competence. As Stefan said, uh, the DOAs are approved. They have competent people. Uh, we have to assume all that. But industry itself is, uh, is feeling that there needs to be attention to develop further or at least maintain uh, competence in the future. Um, competence, we have not been able in this meeting to define very strict criteria, so uh, a new regulation defining competence is not something we are looking for. Uh, checklist guidance, uh, I think it's very important for each DOA to define its own uh, scope of work and, and the subsequent competence that goes with it. And I think uh, repeating the um, the concerns that uh, Stefan discussed led us to a few recommendations. And I think each of you needs to uh, consider your own DOA, uh, not for today, but for tomorrow, for the future. Uh, what is going to happen with my uh, resources? Are my experienced people, my competent people, uh, how long will they be able and, and uh, willing to stay in the company? And are they able to, to provide their competence? So, what is your uh, loss of experienced people uh, prediction? Um, that's about people, uh, the, oh, the experienced people. But what happens normally is that you also, if, if your company is, is doing well in continuity, you're hiring new people, you're getting younger people on board with uh, not yet the experience uh, of your older people. So how do, how do you get competence uh, transferred into those new people? Uh, training, as you mentioned, is not, uh, it's, it's a, a means, but it's not the only means. It's, it's getting exposure, it's 
teaming with younger and older people, all kinds of things you can think about. So think about how you want to do that. Then we also see um, very competent DOAs, but suddenly there's new technology coming on board. So even the experienced people need to go back uh, and learn about new technologies and, and try to establish and create their competence. So that's another axis of concern. And then, of course, we all uh, see sometimes new regulations come on board. And I think this room here with uh, 500 people, um, we are all trying to be more competent on new regulations. And I, I can refer to the OSD discussions of the, the past and the LOI discussions we have today. We all try to understand how to uh, apply those new regulations. Um, higher complexity data information overflow, um, certainly also true. I think you also see that um, companies are under pressure to, to do more work with less people. So that's also a concern to, uh, to take into account. Is your system, your DOA, your uh, design assurance system robust enough for that? Um, so that's this is the final slide. Um, I think it was very good to have the diversity in the group. A lot of discussion, uh, big companies, small companies, mature companies, newer companies that uh, worked very well. We had to, uh, to establish understanding of each other's problems. We shared our, the topics of discussion already early on, uh, a few, uh, one or two weeks ago, we already communicated about how we wanted to have the discussion and that helped a lot, I think, um, to bring some structure and order in, uh, in the day. Uh, we had very good active participation uh, of industry, but also uh, EASA representatives uh, were very active in the discussion and, and helping us uh, to find uh, some way out of the, of the topic. So this is the team that we had, and uh, we had a, a fun day. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Not Armin. Sorry for that. <laughs> you know I'm Frank. <laughs> and I think what is really good, what was also mentioned here, that we work together, we face the same problem. Uh, we are involved in, for example, the ASD group on competences, and I think that shows that we identified similar topics and, and have the same issues to, to tackle. The next group, Stefan, you want to go through the whole room? <laughs> the next group uh, discussed continued awareness, and I have a list of four names, Dieter Stege, Mario Pirozzi, Alistair Erskine, and Ilo, Ilko Baker. That's the wrong presentation, should be group. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, can you go back to the presentation? My mistake. <laughs> yes, Paul Condi and Sebastian Bruckmeier on ETSO. Sorry for that. <laughs> My mistake. <laughs> but at least I managed you to get up and make your way to the stage, huh? <laughs> listening to the authority. Yes. <laughs> if you want to, my phone. Christian. Oh, so many people here. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Sebastian Purkmeier, and I'm representing Gita Aviation who is uh, designing and producing air cargo pallet nets and cargo restraint straps. And together with my colleague Paul uh, from Trick Avionics, being involved in the development of avionics equipment, I have the pleasure uh, to highlight for you the most uh, interesting topics which we have uh, uh, addressed during the site meeting. So this is a short list of participants. Uh, which was quite good that we had uh, different participants from different disciplines 
So from mechanical and structural side, like uh, seed manufacturers, but also uh, developers of avionic equipment, and also for our cargo equipment, like uh, containers and cargo uh, tie-down equipment. So the main points we have discussed during the site meeting have been uh, ETSO change classification in general, so major versus minor changes. Uh, which uh, top, the topic which was uh, most interesting for us, for example, was the effects you could have if you're introducing cumulative uh, minor changes uh, to a certain design. A uh, further point was ETSO as minimum performance standard. Uh, so if you have, for example, introduced non-ETSO functions to an ETSO article uh, that could be used, for example, in the military sector, and the further EASA involvement on such equipment. Uh, we're also talking about installation requirements which have been newly introduced to certain ETSO standards, uh, so for example for seats. Uh, the absolutely most uh, important and interesting topic for us uh, was DOA mandatory for certain e uh, ETSO beyond uh, APU. I will come to that afterwards. Quite a scaring topic. And we were talking about uh, bilateral agreements and validation, especially about the Basel and the technical implementation procedure status with the uh, CAAC from China, and what's the status on that. So, Paul, okay. your turn. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, morning, everyone. Um, so, as Sebastian said, one of the main topics that we discussed in the morning was the change classification um, between minor and major uh, changes for ETSO articles. Uh, there were certain interesting examples, especially from uh, the seat belt and seat manufacturers who hold ETSOs on their products, that if they introduce a minor change at the product level, then what is the effect of that change at the higher level, perhaps at an aircraft level? Um, should extra tests be performed? Um, because that could be a major change. Um, there is also uh, something more for information and a point to note that if we hold the ETSO and make a number of minor changes, say perhaps 5, 10, 15, then after 15, what is the thing that you have in your hand? Is it still the same ETSO? Have, have, at some point, have you moved on to a major change on that article? The second area that we discussed and uh, identified was the minimum performance standards. The first one should be well known that non-TSO functions uh, at the moment, EASA verify that there is no effect, negative effect on the TSO function. Um, this is particularly true with my colleagues from the aviation, avionics industry where perhaps their ETSO product can be used um, for a military client, and maybe some extra features are there, but these features at the moment must not have an effect, a negative effect on the ETSO function. Um, one recommendation from industry to consider was the introduction of more CREs and SCs into the certification basis for the ETSO article. There is perhaps some uh, benefit that if we increase the uh, amount of testing at the ETSO article stage, then that gives uh, a better certification coverage when you come to the installation stage of the product. So now coming to the topic, DOA mandatory for certain ETSOs uh, beyond APU, where I told you this was absolutely the most uh, scaring topic for us addressed during the site meeting. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that EASA will probably come up with a new requirement uh, where a DOA, uh, other than an a, uh, AP DOA, would be mandatory for certain ETSO standards. Uh, this could affect, uh, for example, complex equipment. So if we're talking about uh, avionic equipment, for example, but it could also affect, uh, let's say, simple equipment uh, whose failure would have a potential hazardous or catastrophic effect on aircraft level. 
So it could be avionic equipment on the one side, but on the other side it could be even our cargo equipment, which is quite simple design, uh, but uh, its failure effect could, have, uh, could, uh, could be hazardous or catastrophic on aircraft level. So this would be, uh, will be covered under rulemaking task uh, 0727, which is already in place. And we really kindly ask all uh, industry participants uh, which, are, uh, which would be potentially affected by this, so ETSO holders, to really uh, give their comments on that uh, when the notice uh, for proposed amendment will be issued. This will be uh, in, uh, in the first quarter of 2020. So we really ask you to participate in that and to give your comments on that in order to set a clear borderline uh, what is complex, what is non-complex, and uh, for what you, uh, you need to have a DOA in place, for which ETSOs. So then about the bilateral agreements, we talked about the bilateral agreement or the TIP, which is uh, 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 actual uh, being in process uh, with the CAAC. Uh, yesterday in the presentation we heard already that there will be no automatic acceptance for ETSO uh, in China. So in both ways there will be no automatic acceptance. However, it is good that there will be a streamlined validation process. So we heard also yesterday in the presentation uh, that it will no, uh, not take longer than three to five weeks once you applied for validation of your ETSO in China. So it's good to have such a streamlined uh, validation process. Uh, we further addressed the potential problem that uh, in China for CTSO you have a two years validity only. Uh, this is not uh, in place in the ASA. If you have an ETSO, there is no limited validity for your ETSO. So EASA told us that they uh, are facing the issue how to address that topic and how to, ha uh, how to handle this. However, uh, this topic was not clarified yet because EASA is still working on this, uh, how to handle that in future. Uh, we were also talking about the relation between EASA and US. Uh, so this is not new, however, we talked about it, uh, that uh, if you have an ETSO article that was modified in the US and is, uh, that becomes a PMA, that the ETSO approval of this article is no longer valid, so the ETSO uh, approval of this article is being invalidated and that the uh, ETSO holder is then uh, further no longer responsible for this uh, uh, modified ETSO article anymore. So further uh, we talked about that the tip between EASA and US gives you a provision of using FAA type uh, uh, FAA TSO as certification basis. This was really a good point that was addressed. Uh, this means if you have an FAA TSO where you have a newer version, uh, revision in place than the equivalent EASA T uh, ETSO, uh, that you could apply for approval by using the FAA TSO uh, as certification basis. And later on, if EASA would uh, issue the equivalent uh, new version of the EASA ETSO standard, you could then via minor change only uh, validate this or uh, approve this uh, for ETSO. So what did work well for us for the site meeting? It was a really good organization, thanks to EASA for that. So uh, we received uh, regular updates for the site meetings, uh, which was also very good was that we received a survey, all participants, where we could choose and select uh, the topics that are most interesting for us, which we would like to discuss during the site meeting. It was also very good to have uh, several uh, different EASA experts attending the meeting. So when we were discussing uh, uh, about different sectors, mechanical structure, avionics, cargo, that we had the uh, uh, respective uh, expert from EASA attending the, uh, attending the meeting. And uh, as I said already, we had a good cross-section of different disciplines uh, in regards to participants and representing uh, persons. <coughs> Uh, proposals. It would be good to have more industry representatives uh, participating in such meetings. So we have been a rather small group, unfortunately. Uh, so we think it would be better to have much larger groups because, uh, because then you can get much more uh, feedback from the industry. Uh, 
Furthermore, it was identified by several group uh, participants that other days than Monday or Friday are preferred uh, due to traveling, etc. And uh, we also identified that it would be a good idea to potentially also uh, include TC holder representatives to such meetings uh, in order to address on one hand uh, the requirements to certify uh, a product or equipment, but on the other hand, to also identify the customer needs. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. This was our group. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sebastian. I think the one with China and the two-year validity, we identified that already and we are trying to discuss it with the Chinese in the tip, whether this can be eliminated like all the other tips that you have in constant. But this is something that really depends on the Chinese and we have to see how this will develop. And it's interesting to see that, for example, the ETSO group asks that TC holders also join the discussions because for sure there's an interface that you need to address. And uh, I think we can learn a bit how to organize things and how to better have the discussions balanced and taking all things into account. The next group, and this time I think I get it right, is for STCs. And uh, it's Stephen Tiernan and Franz Riedak who will do the presentations. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Franz Redek, Stephen Tiernan, uh, and in, in ghost here, Fred Steinbergen uh, in spirit. He is, he is here today, uh, and he volunteered uh, to present all this, but then uh, had a good excuse uh, not to be here. Uh, <laughs> so we had to take over on short notice. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one statement to Rob. Is Rob here? Rob Bursma? Is he here? Okay, he promised us to have a speaker badge. That's the only reason why I committed to vol and volunteered to, to have a, a talk today. Uh, I have not received it yet. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, our topic was uh, SDCs, and uh, the companies obviously in our group uh, were all uh, representatives of uh, DOAs uh, preparing uh, SDCs and minor changes on certain aircrafts uh, and products. Um, here is the list of uh, persons attending this uh, meeting. Thank you very much uh, at the first uh, uh, for all of them and their contribution uh, to uh, the presentation, um, and also with the kind support of uh, the three persons from EASA, Rob Bursma, Raphael Aubert, and Nicolas Dupré. Uh, all of them uh, attended, uh, not all of them permanently, but uh, at least to a certain extent, uh, our meeting and, and contributed in, uh, with valuable inputs. Right. Um, uh, the five topics uh, we wanted to highlight uh, out of a number of them. Uh, I should say that we had a rather large list uh, to start with, um, and uh, some of them were identified as not being necessarily part of our uh, group uh, uh, discussion. Some others uh, were defined as uh, regulatory topics uh, which would be uh, appropriately covered in the presentations from EASA during these uh, two days. Uh, but these ones here are the kind of short list of uh, our topics, we discussed uh, the occurrence reporting uh, database, uh, LOI experience sharing uh, as far as we had experience with it, 
um, special condition and certification review items, uh, availability to the applicants. And I've seen that uh, in another presentation already, so it uh, seems to be a common issue. And uh, importance of clear type certification basis definition in the uh, type certification data sheet um, and operational uh, suitability data. Um, that were the topics, and uh, this is what uh, I would like uh, to present now. Um, on the occurrence reporting database, uh, well, uh, the topic was that uh, one of our colleagues brought up that uh, we are kindly uh, required uh, to uh, provide occurrence reports uh, in case of technical or safety-related uh, findings. Um, and um, we seem to... Uh, also, uh, within a design organization, we seem to have an obligation to evaluate um, such occurrences and incidents, uh, not only limited to our own um, designs and our own work, but also in, in regards to industry knowledge, um, in, in the uh, kind of introducing that knowledge into our design and, and uh, trying to make our things better um, based on uh, knowledge and findings uh, in the past uh, and uh, hopefully before such occurrence would appear uh, to ourselves and to our design. So we were kindly asking uh, whether EASA plans uh, to make those data collected through the IR system available to the DOAs to meet their obligation of uh, 239A where it says that we have to um, uh, monitor and uh, identify significant events on other aeronautical products uh, as far as relevant to determine their effect on airworthiness or operational suitability of products being designed by the design organization. So that means we want to learn from this information we provide you, but we want to have it an anonymized, uh, uh, provided to us so that we could uh, appropriately uh, take care about them and um, consider it uh, with our own design. All right, that was the first topic, and now here comes Stephen. Good morning. Uh, so, LOI experience sharing, that was actually the first item that was on the list, as you can imagine at the moment. Um, so I'm gonna jump around on the topics we discussed a bit, not in the order, they're on the screen there. Um, from the group, the, the main uh, makeup of it, I think most of us are currently implementing LOI procedures, and there was a small number who had already uh, working under the LOI process. The main takeaway from, from those guys was really to keep the process flexible. Uh, if, you, if you introduce a rigid procedure, the effectiveness, effectiveness of identifying risks is lost. You know, for example, in your CDI, you may end up with items that are a higher risk than other items, and that, then you don't truly identify the risks because you get driven by the higher risk items. So really it's flexibility. Uh, even to the point that one organization had changed the way they made their groupings in, a, in each STC project they'd done up to that date. So it was basically what works best for each project, uh, project that you do. Uh, and at the end of the day, as long as you can ensure the groups are meaningful, then that should be accepted. Beyond that, the risk assessment becomes quite easy. You follow the guidance material, the AMCs, uh, there's the CM, 21A, 21B, these are all available online. And then the CT6 policy uh, from the DOA, uh, you can get that from your DOA team leader, you won't be able to find it on the website. Uh, for uh, the discussion on the uh, position of the airworthiness, the Office of Airworthiness, um, there were some w w different ideas. I think the main consensus was that this, the uh, LOI process is really a, a, a a job that the Office of Airworthiness will lead. The involvement of CVEs is not necessary, but then again, some organizations were involving CVEs, and that is uh, really a decision that you can make. It's not, not really required if, if you don't want to do that. Um, the action from this was a, a clearer definition uh, of what requirements are covered by which panel or panels. Uh, you know, For example, 571 under panel three, we appreciate some uh, CS requirements will have multiple panels, uh, and I believe this actually already exists internally in EASA, uh, and so that may be disseminated amongst the organizations as a, as a helpful guide. Yeah, the next one was uh, special conditions certification review items and the availability to applicants for uh, 
uh, SDCs uh, in this case here. Um, it, I think I remember at least a half dozen times we uh, brought that uh, topic up that uh, to an applicant it is essential that we have all the uh, criteria available at the time when we do a major minor classification uh, because it's our obligation and we're willing to take that obligation. However, uh, we are missing some important information and that is in this case uh, the certification review items or special conditions, however you want to call it, uh, which are uh, to a certain extent not available. I, I would say to a large extent not available. Um, they are available for a very short period of time as a, a, a proposed uh, certification review item, uh, but then they disappear from the EASA website because they are dealt uh, with between the applicant and EASA individually. Um, uh, we as uh, SDC applicants are not necessarily in the position to uh, uh, check on a daily business uh, or monthly business uh, all the certification review items which may be out. And uh, I want to add that uh, proposed certification review items may not be uh, the wording of the final certification review item. So in the end, we don't know about it. Um, but and I think that this agreed that uh, uh, topics which are covered by a certification review item must be uh, classified as major, and therefore we need to know them. So it's important, essential to us uh, to have um, uh, these uh, uh, certification review items available, even though it is only in a generic way. We, we agree and we accept that uh, there are some intellectual property included in some of these certification review items, uh, but uh, I believe it is uh, acceptable uh, to us uh, to have a certain uh, generic wording which we need to know in order to comply with the regulations. So. Um, uh, we also uh, appreciate and we recognize that the ASA was working quite uh, uh, strongly on uh, covering uh, this topic on uh, at least product level um, with uh, providing annexes to the type certificate data sheet. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, that is uh, well done and it's still continued to be updated. Uh, we appreciate that. That's very helpful. However, uh, we would like you to progress down to 5.7 tons uh, and not uh, stay with uh, above 100 tons uh, aircraft. Um, and um, yeah, the action to EASA would be, could the EASA invest in uh, continuing the processes uh, on the uh, type certificate data sheet annexes and also on uh, standalone crease such as for fire extinguishers, uh, for uh, whatever else, software topics, etc. We would like you to do that. Thank you very much. So this next one, I won't spend too much time on it because I know some of the previous groups have touched on this. Uh, again, it's the identifying the type certification basis from the TCDS. Now, I don't mean to pick on Airbus again, but the A320 was mentioned again as a shared experience when we've all come to identify the type certification basis lots of variants and you're reading down through the type certificate, it becomes very difficult to actually identify what is the type certification basis. Um, really the action out of this was, and there's not much to say beyond that, is that we would request that EASA improve the readability of the type certification data sheets, uh, making it easier for us to actually identify the, the uh, certification basis. So, last not least, operational suitability data was discussed. Um, uh, the participants uh, identified difficulty uh, to appropriately apply OSD on projects uh, due to lack of feedback from EASA. And not because EASA is not willing to do that, but simply because uh, we believe it's a minor uh, OSD change, therefore EASA is not involved in it. Uh, so um, we uh, would wish to have um, kind of um, uh, a contact uh, identified within EASA to uh, uh, contact him on a short notice and, and ask him specific topics because obviously OSD is a new topic to us uh, uh, to a certain extent. Um, then 
We also discussed that uh, the conditions under which an LOI is not provided to an operator, uh, although the regulation says you should provide LOI uh, constituents uh, to the operator, uh, we believe there are certain arguments and, and topics uh, existing uh, not to provide uh, such uh, OSD, uh, uh, specifically here about MMEL, uh, to operators uh, and, uh, or provide them only on, on a charge basis. So it's, it's not part of the SDC, but it can, can be used uh, and amended uh, to the SDC. Um, the question to EASA is, uh, could EASA provide some real case example of FCD and cabin crew data changes to support the understanding of these topics? Uh, that was identified by some of us. And um, um, the other question was, uh, do OSD changes or the OSD constituents we provide and develop uh, need to be identified in the SDC document? Uh, and uh, if, if that is a yes, uh, does it apply to major and minor OSD? Okay, we would like to be interested in that. Uh, and that uh, concludes our uh, presentation. Uh, and we thank you very much for your attendance. Franz, we, we got a question uh, about CVE involvement in LOI was optional. Can you, maybe that was the understanding from one of your, the slides. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can explain a bit. Um, the, the topic uh, was such that um, uh, we believe that an LOI, first of all, is a relief to the operator. Uh, so that means uh, that not providing an LOI uh, to a certain extent is uh, acceptable. It's certainly safe uh, because uh, it, it means that if the equipment has any failure indication or any other anomaly, uh, it will ground the aircraft. So by definition that is safe. Uh, so we believe that uh, for certain optional installations specifically, okay, uh, non-required uh, installations uh, with cockpit controls, uh, that uh, we could identify such uh, uh, OSD constituents as an, an optional, uh, you know, a giveaway to, to an operator, rather than, uh, it, as the regulation says, it must be provided. Okay, in interesting. I think that needs to be further discussed. Okay. Maybe the point on the way is now. I think it's, it's quite interesting to, to learn from the discussions and the, the feedback and the actions identified where you see need for improvement and uh, I discussed with Alain already there are quite a number of points where we have to see how we could uh, better address the points and, and sometimes we're also surprised why these topics are raised in the first place. We thought everything should be clear but maybe not clear enough. So it, it's, I think it's really valuable to have this feedback sessions from the side meetings. And uh, maybe one comment when we do the survey at the end of this uh, conference, please provide also your comments on the side meetings, maybe how to better organize them, uh, how to Im improve them. I think that's really helpful. So coming to the next group, independent system monitoring, and we have Sega Özdemir and Riziri Makato who will do the presentation. Good morning, 
My name is Sega Özdemir. I am the head of independent monitoring function in Turkish Aerospace. Today, with my colleague Mr. Markato from Embraer, we would like to share our feedbacks from the site meeting Group 7, Independent System Monitoring, called ISM. As representatives of ISM functions of the aviation sector, last year we had the first chance to come together in a site meeting of EASA. It was our first opportunity and we would like to thank for this to EASA. Like last year, like last year, this year's uh, topics uh, were uh, very uh, fruitful. The uh, outcome of the site meeting was very fruitful, and there were too many up-to-date topics of the OA community trying to find the best practices and the way forward for the ISM functions. The first topic was the ISM role in the OA performance. And we continued our discussions with the ISM experience with auditing of LOI processes. How to use digitalization in ISM activities was also another interesting topic. And we concluded our uh, discussions with the ISM role in control of design suppliers. ISM role in DOA performance. As we have seen in yesterday presentations of EASA, a new systematic has been introduced to the sector called the DOA dashboard, showing the DOA performance of the design organizations. And ISM performance was uh, one of the core elements of this dashboard. Uh, and as a working group seven, uh, we have concluded that ISM is a foundation for ASA DOA oversight. Because, for example, in LOI process, similarly, a prerequisite is a good ISM to be put in place. ISM has an appreciable effect on the final decision. And in order to satisfy these requirements, we need to go far beyond the auditing as a means of like scorecard systematic, ad hoc investigations, and also sample checks. This means we will act proactively. While making this or performing this acting proactively, a risk-based approach should be used to focus our resources. Regarding the internal follow-up, all the design organization should strengthen the value of ISM in their organization. This is really, really critical. ISM experience in auditing LOI processes. We all know that LOI is a relatively new concept for the sector. So like all the other stakeholders, the ISM functions should have the basic knowledge, maybe trainings on LOI processes before monitoring them. Besides, uh, we should use the competences, the necessary competences within our organizations, like CVs. We may use the CVs in our independent system monitoring activities in order to point out the non-compliances in a more effective way. Another important input will be also from the EASA feedbacks. Now I am leaving the stage to my colleague Marcotto for the remaining topics. Thank you. Hello. So we are going to talk a little bit about the ISM and the digitalization. It's, uh, it's growing exponentially within the design organization, even in EASA, as we saw yesterday. And uh, we discussed a lot about the whole of the ISM in this process. And uh, since the ISM needs to monitor the design organization uh, working, and uh, we see that the information systems can help the ISM on its whole, since it increases its capacity to explore the data generated during the design organization activities. Even uh, we can manage to create some tools that allow us to avoid the no compliances 
in the critical tasks of the design organization. Another issue that we discussed was the ISM role in the control of design suppliers. So uh, we need to establish with the design organization a clear uh, interface with the design supplier in order to create a, a efficient monitoring activity because uh, sometimes we face some issues regarding prop, prop intellectual property and uh, this should be clearly addressed on the agreements that we have with our suppliers. This agreement can be a contract or even a design organization interface document. And uh, also we can try to address on this agreement this gray zone that we have between the manufacturing and design data because ISM is concerned to the design data, but sometimes the understanding of what is design data and manufacturing data clashes and we need to have it uh, the clearest way in the contract or in the design and organization interface document. The delegation of the ISM tasks to the supplier is possible, but the design organization hold, approval holder must have in mind that the, responsibility for the independent system monitoring remains with the design organization that's delegating the function. So the issues we encountered during our side meeting is uh, the size of the DOA matters a lot for this subject of the ISM function. LOI, as an example, is not a core issue for all the DOAs. The DOAs that deals on the daily business, most with minor changes and minor repairs, doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, chances to exercise the LOI since they just do the minor approvals. And uh, the ISM is very important for them to establish the connection with the ASA and it is from where comes most of their performance assessment. Uh, working Group 7, the ICM group, agrees that is a, f a function that's e having its responsibility within the DOA increasing each day, and we as an industry must follow up better the ISM. And uh, one action that we uh, identified for the industry and the industry requesting to EASA is to create a training on ISM best practice and expectations, and also to put in, in public consultation the DOARI of electronic type design data and record keeping system and use of digital signature in order to us to have a, a minimum standard for where we can go on the digitalization and uh, the clarification on the DOA performance, including the ISM performance. The industry action that we at the side meeting group will try to start and then to involve all of you ISM functions in the next step is to organize networking sessions facilitated by ASA since the, our side meeting hostess uh, offered to help us to, to, to do these sessions because we think that the industry needs to discuss more the ISM function in order to make it improve. So, almost concluding, what did you work well? We are seeing that the interest on the independent system monitoring is increasing each year. Uh, the side meeting is a very good open discussion platform some of us was, were talking about uh, having one more day of side meetings, but uh, it's not a, a defined idea yet. Uh, we had a, a very good team spirit with the people at the, the, our side meeting, uh, moderated by Bulent and Francesco. Very good moderating. Uh, it was a, a good time with uh, what we see a good out outcome. And that was our team.
and we'd like to thank you about the, the, for the opportunity to share this ICM topic with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I think the ISM group is, is quite a good example because we started it, I think, last year the first time, but the group throughout the year met at least once or twice uh, independently from the workshop to, because they thought the topics are so interesting and need to be addressed in, in a continuous manner. And I think we can facilitate this, but it's you, industry, that should be the driver and have an interest in this. And I think also some others mentioned it for their groups. Uh, you would like to have a more constant discussion on certain topics and not only once per year during these site meetings or this annual conference. And we can help you to, to organize these things, uh, but you must be the driver behind it. And with that, we come to the last group, and now it's the right one, continued averseness. So Dita, Mario, Alistair, and Eko, can you please come to the stage? Thanks. Good. Hello to everybody. It's a bit unfair to us, of course, to stand up uh, earlier, but now being already in the break, we try to keep it short. We've got as a team the pleasure to give you the debrief of this site meeting number eight about uh, continued airworthiness. And Marco said earlier, something appears to be very clear and it ends up as maybe not as clear as it should be. This is also one of the final conclusions I could already draw. Uh, my name is, as I said, Dieter Steg, and I will start with the first uh, topic here. I haven't got an introduction, but it works. We will go into four specific topics. Keep in mind, yes, it was a good host for EASA. We got uh, Ian there and Carmen and Markus, but the main topic was to share experience, to share problems from the participants. And as we were diverse as the other teams, obviously, we ended up in talking about topics very often without the solution. So we can draw some of the topics without providing the solution. I will start with the first point of events occurring in maintenance. And I was asked to, to explain here to say, when some occurrences appear worldwide somewhere, for instance, in that particular case, as reported by our colleague, in the maintenance, and it appeared as a human error failure. There are some still expectations inside industry, but also inside DOA team leader, uh, teams, that there's a responsibility within the design organization to rectify, to provide design changes. I think we are all common in the term foolproof design, but how far maybe is this expectation uh, supporting the safety? Where is really the handover from the responsibility point of view, being in the design organization or being somewhere in the maintenance area? Therefore, it uh, was one of our conclusion to say, when we talk about occurrences and when we talk about providing technical solutions, we quite often need more clarity, coming back to the term, more clarity about handshakes, communication, not only from the EU, but also with other foreign countries and their legislation system. So as I said, just one topic, therefore I hand over now to the next, uh, which is, there's another slide. Was it? Mario. Morning, my name is Mario. Uh, like uh, most popular plumber, Super Mario. <laughs> my, my brother's name is uh, Luigi, ciao Luigi. Uh, I, I have to say hello also to my mom. Ciao, mama. Ciao, papa. But I, I cannot uh, forget uh, my wife. 
You, you know, otherwise I cannot uh, come back to at home. Ciao, Annalisa. Okay. Don't, don't worry, the tears. Don't worry, Diti, I, I become uh, so professional like you, okay, like German. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, I prepared and uh, shared with them uh, a slide uh, uh, introducing uh, this topic that is uh, uh, not so easy topic. Uh, I put on the left side the continuum of their worthiness and on the right side the accident, uh, serious incident investigation. Uh, and I put in the middle uh, a border, a red line showing that uh, uh, the two uh, processes are uh, uh, quite uh, separated. No? On the left side you have something that is relevant for part 21. On the right side that is not under the DOE perimeter, no? But uh, at a certain time, there is a connection, okay? When we are aware that there is a, an unsafe condition, then we receive input from the uh, investigation body uh, to open uh, an occurrence, okay? Uh, that was not so clear to everybody, so we think that uh, it is necessary to clarify the perimeter, no? We need to clarify when we uh, have to involve the ASA, at which stage, uh, considering the investigation body, and considering that the ASA, in principle, cannot participate to the accident in serious incident investigation. So, uh, so finally, we think that uh, probably uh, it is better to go deeper on this and to highlight that the two uh, processes are uh, anyway uh, separated. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Super Mario. Um, now on a different subject, we discussed uh, repairs approved by uh, the FEA and in the EASA system. Um, we had a a talk with a client of us, I work for ADZ, and they said, well, when I have my repair approved by a DER, it's more, much more easier and simpler. We had a discussion in the group whether or not that is true. We ended up in saying, okay, we live in a different part of the world. We live in another, um, uh, under another set of regulations. So we're not going to discuss that here. Um, but there are tiny differences, and probably the um, International Working Group has um, identified that. And Frank Steffen said yesterday um, very clearly uh, that the task of the Certification Oversight Board is actually to ensure a global level playing field for European industry. Now they added a note when a repair is coming from the FEA or is approved under the FEA system, is coming into the EASA system, um, and that's just a little note under the three requirements to which a repair has to um, comply to when it's accepted in the ASA system. Um, and that note says that a repair, a minor repair, has to go through um, an EASA Part 21 before being implemented. Now, I don't know, but we are, our um, uh, organizations under the impression that this note is there, so there is something to, uh, to say to the organization uh, implementing those repairs, but we're not under the impression that it's uh, really followed. Uh, it could be made more clear, this note. Um, so that's my advice for the EASA. Okay. Good morning. Um, I think one of the first topics we, we talked about was what actually constitutes the instructions for continued airworthiness. And um, the great takeout, I think, was that it, it was unclear. We had representatives, uh, smaller, larger DOAs from airlines, from TC holders. And the, the, the room was uh, divided, really, as what constitutes the ICA. In particular, um, 
I think in I IPC was, was mentioned, is that ICA or does it sit outside of ICA? And uh, the consensus ultimately was that anything that would otherwise be in the AMM by virtue of Appendix H uh, and hence required to ensure the continued airworthiness that any document, no matter where you put that information, if it should otherwise have been in an AMM, would still be ICA. Uh, it seems an important part to discuss, first of all, and uh, it still seems vague, but obviously we know from the presentations that EASA also is looking at it with the uh, NPA 2018-01. So thank you for that presentation yesterday as well. Clearly, uh, there is still some misunderstanding. So. Um, we also uh, discussed how the, um, how the FAA and the ARSA do differ, certainly with, with the readiness of ICA and when that should be delivered relative to the C of A of the aircraft. Um, I think most people understood that that is a difference that is, is still there um, and, and we live with it. I think that's about, about it for the ICA constituents. Thank you. Last but not least, I've got the pleasure, with the support from the team, to go now to into subject, which was, uh, from my point of view, at least a kind of conclusion from the site making. And allow me, please, some minutes to share a presentation which I had given into the team at the site meeting as a kind of um, stimulation for discussion. What did I do? I said, out of a training session, I typically uh, give in uh, the company to share my understanding of clarity. Marco said earlier, clarity, it's an assumption quite often. Is it really clear to everybody? Talking about terminologies, what is continued airworthiness? And I want to start left-hand side to say, are we all clear what is state of design? And Rachel, you worked in that area of ICAO, so all the ICAO Annex 8 airworthiness of aircraft is the basis of our work. So to design something, the type certificate here is just representing, of course, any type of approval, but under the responsibility of the state of design, so purpose-driven. ICAO is saying, the Annex 8 is saying, that process shall lead and ensure that compliance with the applicable airworthiness requirements is ensured of that particular state, granting the TC or the approval. There's an obligation to the state of design to transmit, and I've re-emphasized, to transmit the instructions, those instructions mandatory for the continuing airworthiness of an aircraft in operation. These are not my terms, these are the terms out of the ICAO Annex 8. Giving the type design data or any other approved data into the hands of the state of manufacture is now in handover in ultimate responsibility. So this responsibility given from the state of design into the state of manufacture should be visible to everybody because this is a kind of communication tool. So granting data with a clear statement, is it approved, covered by TC, STC, whatever, or non-approved design data makes later on the continuing airworthiness aspects different. Therefore, the term airworthy and certification in total could be seen, is seen as the initial airworthiness, very often used as a term. And the status of an aircraft, as it said here, is the question aircraft engine or propeller, so our parts topic, our product topics, to make sure it approves to the, conf uh, to the approved design data and is in a condition of safe operation. And now we come to the point which was subject of the site meeting mainly. Now we are facing the real world of operation where the safety applies. Safety means there's a risk either eliminated or mitigated and under control to an acceptable level, acceptable to the, what we declare the state of registry. Therefore the task, the performance, the measures, the tools, the regulations are applicable from that state. And although it seems quite simple, and keep this please as a simple chart, and again I re-emphasize these are words you find in this IQ Annex 8, I can assure you, but these are in indicating a simple left to right approach. But what we as businesses need is now the multi-layer condition. The 
because we are multinational. We are embodied in, an, in a very complex situation, in a global world. So state of design is one aspect, but state of design could be different for the aircraft, could be different for the engine, could be different for the SCC. The same is in manufacture. We all have, I guess, suppliers somewhere in the world. And ultimately, it was a site meeting to say, what does it mean into the continuing airworthiness facet? So thanks for sharing this view. My plea is now, whenever we do the, re the uh, regulations, updates, so rulemaking activities, or even in sharing conferences, my plea is to have always a kind of line of sight back to the original known communication means established by ICAO. What are we serving for by implementing rules, by explaining rules, by having answers for the DOA team leaders? Is it now an activity under the state of design? Is it a supporting activity for a foreign country? Keep in mind, 191 states are currently registered in the ICAO. Therefore, the operational situation, which we as a TC holder shall support, does vary significantly across the world. I don't want to disturb you any longer, so thanks for providing me with the time. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, interesting slide, and I got some comment from Alain. He might want to reuse it for some internal purposes. <laughs> he had something developed himself already, but uh, maybe in a less fancy and clear way. So thanks a lot. Yeah, we're a little bit over time. Uh, if we could come back in, let's say, 25 minutes after the coffee break, that would be great. Thank you.
stay here. Yeah. And then, so the green one is forward, the red one is back. I, I can see, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It's working, at least. Yes, oh, it works, huh? Wonderful. <laughs> nice thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can do this again. But so I, I think I we can. Because I didn't really do a, a check, so I will ah. put the stopwatch in. Okay. okay. Yeah, huh? So we can put it here and nobody sees it. And then we know where we are. Because I think wow. we're quite <laughs> short. So there are 10 minutes, uh, 17 cups for this one. Yes, uh, yes, but uh, I think anyway. will not be a big problem. Oh, no, no. Should not be a big problem. No, but we can try to tune, huh? so we have the watch there. So that means we would finally have um, 20, 25 minutes. Something like this, half an hour. Yeah, yeah good. Light coming from uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, six, four. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is nice. Anyway, we can see. Yeah, that's good, huh? Where we are. I think. Yeah, it's good.
Okay, could you please take your seats? We want to continue. Just one more point on the feedback sessions we just listened to. I think there were a number of points that we as the other will have to, to work on and we will make sure that we follow on with the recommendations or actions that, that you highlighted. The next topic is more of a technical topic but also at the same time something that you as DOAs have to address. And it's about additive manufacturing and how you as DOAs have to address things. And I would like to ask Alexandru Inake and Wolfgang Hoffmann to do this presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I hope you had a good um, coffee break and uh, some uh, nice discussion with, uh, with your colleagues. Um, yes, we are here today this morning to, to try to provide you some, uh, some information on additive manufacturing uh, and some DOA aspects related to, to this. First of all, thank you for um, uh, pro proposing this topic to, to the agency for, for, for this workshop. Uh, the survey we run uh, before the workshop, in this survey, uh, the additive manu manufacturing score quite high, so that's why we are here today in front of you. Um, how we build this uh, presentation together with Wolfgang, who is a um, structural expert in uh, large airplanes department. We thought to have two parts. The first part, Wolfgang will go with you through some technical aspects of uh, additive manufacturing, including uh, challenges, including the ASA strategy, some events we are organizing on this topic uh, annually. Um, also, he will present you some developments in, uh, in the area of industry standards and some uh, available guidance material. In the second part, I will touch on some DOA aspects, um, type design, material specification, process specification, interfaces in particular with production organizations, and also what is the impact on DOA if we have a significant change or not. Uh, when uh, a DOA is contemplating starting uh, additive manufacturing uh, uh, activities. And in the end, some closure remarks. So I will invite now Volkan to, to go with you through the first part. Thank you, Alex. So just uh, I have to take a deep breath because a lot of people here. And um, I would say Let's put the focus on you first. Uh, so may I ask a question to you? So how many of you, you can raise your fingers, uh, have to deal with the additive manufacturing technology currently? Or, okay. Okay, then. well, it's um, somehow congruent with our general uh, observations. So, but I think I can focus a bit more on the first three introductory slides, which are more technical, to explain what it is. So what you see here, I'm afraid it's not a good quality, but uh, you may see 
this is a kind of CAT system which is building up layer by layer the ele electronic part. And um, so it doesn't take so much time, but you see the part is being uh, built up uh, in, in an electronic way. And with the additive manufacturing technology, we can do it with hardware. So this is a big difference. Uh, it takes a bit more time than uh, just doing this uh, via bits and bytes, uh, like here in the picture. Um, but there are different technology. They have all one in common. This is, uh, you have multiple material um, or fusible material, and you m will melt it layer by layer and build up the part after a certain long time. Um, different technologies for this are available, so you can do this with laser melt techniques. A laser is melting material, or with an electron beam. Uh, so electron beam is also melting the material. Um, you have just in detail uh, slightly different uh, possibilities with the methods and uh, advantages and some disadvantages when you compare them. And um, so we go just to the next slide. When we see this technology, is, it's quite nice actually. You have kind of starting material, feedstock material we call it, which is mainly metallic or polymers. Um, you can get it in form of powder or in form of a more solid wire or piece of plastic and all this will be melted in the second process in a machine, which you see there, uh, which uh, shouldn't be some whole black box. It should be <laughs> more white box li like it is uh, depicted here. So with white box I would like to express you should know what the machine is doing in detail because it may have influence on your material which comes out after on structural strengths or fatigue uh, properties. So, and then finally, after the print process, you will have um, some nice shiny parts. They're looking good, uh, just ready for installation, you, you would think. But this is uh, not really the case, so you would have to do a, some post-processing for this uh, part, so that means uh, surface finish to remove the surface rough, roughness, with, uh, which also can uh, initiate cracks. And you would have to be sure that the bulk material is really okay, no voids in there, no hollow things with unmelted material. And uh, so you have a lot of uncertainties in the final part. You have uncertainties in the machine, and you have uncertainties in the input material. For example, in purification of the material, when you have oxygen, too much oxygen in your metal powder, um, so lots of things can go wrong during the melting process and you don't get the material you would like to get or you are used to get from the um, machining uh, area, let's say. So we have a lot of questions. Then it's not an unsolvable prob uh, problem, so you have just to put a bit of effort into it to understand the whole um, process behind. And we come to the next one. So this is the old area, you know. So we have a big piece of metal. We machine it so that we get finally the form or the shape uh, with the part. And of course, you are producing a lot of metallic waste you would have to reuse this, and um, so it costs a lot of money. And this is a big disadvantage. And with the additive layer manufacturing, so you can build an object just with the material you need, more or less. So you build it up layer by layer, and you don't have so much debris. And you have other really big advantages. Um, so you can reduce the material needs and the costs up to 90%. So this is a well, maximum, maximum value, I would say. And you, took, you can do through specific design um, also a tremendous weight saving up to 40%. So the parts, just going back, which you see there on the right side, uh, the part in the background is the original part and the part in the foreground is uh, the part which was additive manufactured by using a specific design. So where you just leave the load paths 
the material where you have the load path transfer. So you can really, for this part, um, have a weight saving of 60%. This is quite something. Okay, going back again. So, we don't want to do this anymore. Of course, the optimum uh, thing would be if you could print everything. And um, there we have to propose our strategy. strategy. So we are at an um, airworthiness regulator normally being approached by such a technology and we don't know that much about. So we have to gather some experience and we have to rely on the industry um, to have information exchange uh, to understand the technology and the processes behind and the product, the product which is being uh, produced and its dedicated use uh, in, in aviation. So this is a very important thing, number one. The second one is we have to identify a potential safety environmental risks. So is there a specific risk on the part when we don't know the material proper properties or there's a widespread in papi uh, pr material properties? Of course there is a risk and we, we have to be aware of this and we have to try to mitigate those risks. So we are working closely together with the industry to get all those information to discuss all those things and also with the NAAs who are un, under responsibility of the surveying uh, of the POAs, of the production organizations who are applying those machines, of course. The further step is once when we are aware of um, what are the risks and how can we mitigate, so we have to, evol uh, to monitor the evolution. The machines uh, will be developed further. So. They started initially, let's say, with a one laser machine for metal um, melting. So I, I will just, uh, to make it more easy, to um, refer to the metal process. There are others as well, so, but it's uh, too less time to, um, to explain this. So for the machines, for example, for the metal melting that is being done with the laser system, they started with one laser. In the meantime, we have quad laser machines so we have four lasers which doing independent, independently the melting. And this is a further development and we have to see if this is, um, has got an influence on the, uh, on the product um, as well. And we have to check if our means for mitigation are still effective or not or if we have to do something more. And that means we have um, frequent, on a frequently basis to review and revise uh, implementation of strategy uh, as necessary. This is in, in those uh, five points our main strategy, first of all to understand and then to track everything and the further development. So I, I guess one of the main questions from your side is do we need any new additional requirements to cope with the new technology? So we have to, to do more effort to show more substantiation, which is, of course, involved by spending more money. And uh, this is possibly not very much appreciated by you. The answer is, currently, we don't need new requirements. So our top-level requirements, Part 21, the CSs, are enough. They, they cover everything. I will come later to, uh, to the main paragraphs which are dealing with this. And we mainly um, would like to remind how repairs and design changes have to be done in detail and what is the impact of AM on design organizations or on product organizations and on maintenance organizations. So this will be explained a bit more in detail in the second part by Alex. The requirements, so the governing rule is the 603 requirement for materials. Mm. It says the suitability and durability of materials used for parts, the failure of which could adversely affect safety must be based upon experience and test, conform to specifications, meeting design data of course, and 
consider environmental effects, temperature, moisture, etc. So this is the requirement we start with. The next two about the materials is starting with the 605, the fabrication method, and this is the additive manufacturing, obviously a new technology, a fabri fabrication method. Um, they must produce a consistently sound structure, so without any spread of material properties, in the best case. Huh? And uh, this is what, where we have to be sure. So if a fabrication process, such as gluing, spot welding, and, or, or heat treating, so the spot welding, or let's say the, the laser welding process, comes close to the, to the um, additive manufacturing with uh, laser melt methods. So all this requires a close control to reach these objectives. The process must be performed under an approved process specification. And um, to the process specification we come later. It's also a very important thing. This belongs to the ASA strategy as well, that we are involved in developing those process specification. And we have the B. Each new aircraft fabrication method must be substantiated by a test program. Okay, that says all. So when you buy such a machine, it's a new method, you have to do some substantiation. Um, what would be the extent of this substantiation? Well, it would depend on would you like to produce critical parts, safety critical parts on aircraft, then there's a lot of substantiation. And we would switch to the 613. Um, if you have less critical or non-loaded parts, let's say polymer material in the cabin kind of armrest cover, well, you would possibly just have to do the, um, the fireproof testing, and that's it. So this is not safety relevant if you have their uh, a broken material finally. Huh? So that shows a, a variety of, um, of parts. It depends on the criticality. Yeah, for the criticality, most critical parts, so we have really the tough requirements of 613, um, which says mechanical strength properties and design value materials. Most of them for metallic material, um, that is being done already. We, we have them uh, MMPDS, the material handbook, where you have lots of material values in there with different heat treatments and uh, different production ways. So, uh, well, you have the rollings in, in ST direction and so on. So you have all important parameters for the materials listed there. But on the additive manufactured material, we don't have anything there currently. So this is, for example, one thing. Um, where um, the industry together with the authorities are working on to have an additional chapter in the materials handbook in the MMPDS on the um, additive manufactured hardware, let's say, or material. Um, for the 613, of course, when you have critical parts to produce, um, we have um, to establish design values on a statistical basis. We have the so-called A and B basis. This is a different confidence level, so you have the for the A, uh, a confidence level of 99%. So that means when you check the material, the properties should at 99% always be the same when you have hundreds of samples. And uh, this would, would have to be done for the additive manufactured parts or material as well, so that you would have to do a statistic, produce a lot of samples, do a lot of testing, and um, to find out if your process is really stable, pr producing good material. So, the other side of this is, to gather experience on this new technology, we, we just um, arranging workshops to, uh, with the industry and with other authorities together, uh, and the first of them um, were quite generic, just doing presentations to see how far the people are, what, do, what are they doing, and we did the first one in uh, 2016, in Cologne and a uh, second one the year after and uh, turned out to be a good thing to do it every year. So, and uh, you see the development, so the first uh, two ones they were generic to get a rough overview of what is being done with this technology in the industry. And then it gets more specific, similar to this workshop here with breakout sessions before, 
uh, the presentations uh, so that uh, all participants can really discuss the points which are very important for them, to discuss their needs. And we've tried to do this as well now, so we've changed to a more specific topic on the additive manufacturing. One of the first ones was 2018 with the machine knowledge and training, so we've invited machine producers and uh, the users, and we let them just put them together and let them discuss, so what are the needs? And uh, we found out for the machine producers, it was very important to know about the requirements in aviation as well, so that they can tune their machines and that they have an understanding for, for the big need of precision and repeatability of the material. Yeah, you see, so we have done the sixth workshop on additive manufacturing two weeks ago here in Cologne, and in the meantime, we do it uh, together with uh, the FAA. So we have a combined workshop in additive manufacturing to harmonize our work at a very early status, and it, uh, I have to admit, so it worked quite fine. And we do it now um, on a basis that we do it here in Cologne and the other time somewhere in the US. Um, it's being organized uh, on a common basis by both parties. Um, if you're interested, I think uh, for most of the workshops, you still have material to download from the ASA website. So there you can see what was the outcome of discussions and what are the presentations, so you can get a rough overview of this. And an additional thing is to be involved into the standardization work. So that means we have to have specifications for the material, for the machine process. And this all has to be discussed with the industry, with the experienced people who are working with the machines. They know what are the uh, bad things you can, uh, you can encounter. And um, there are some subgroups for the uh, specific um, specifications. This is a powder specification, the feedstock material. That means you feed the machine with not with ink and paper, as we know it from at home. So you feed it with uh, metallic powder or polymer powder, for example. And there's a specific specification necessary for this because it's, uh, you have to, for example, you shouldn't mix powders on, from different batches or lots. This may be dangerous. No? You should have a powder in can control, and you should store the powder accordingly to, well, most of the time, moisture is an issue, huh? so you should store it under specific uh, conditions. So all this will be uh, mentioned in those uh, specifications. You have um, process specifications, that means for the machines itself, the electron beam, EBM, the laser beam melting, the powder bed fusion, the wire, um, direct energy deposition, those are the main methods we are using. And in those specifications, it's fixed what are the problems, what, what kind of parameters you should uh, have constant and control, under control. And then we have the material specifications. Do we have to make a post-processing of the material? Huh? For example, there's a very famous hipping process, hot isostatic pressing. Um, for some small voids, which are, let, let's say, non-really melted powder in the material, uh, for small areas, you can heal this material via post-processing. The hot isostatic um, um, pressing is, um, you do it really at high temperature for three hours and under 1,000 atmosphere, you leave the material there. It's short below the recrystallization temperature and it will be healing and small voids will be vanishing there. So it doesn't prevent you from doing uh, fatigue tests on those samples as well. But it's solvable and um, some um, OEMs have shown uh, when they put a lot of effort into this, they have a high uh, repeatability, even higher than for castings. For castings we have, you may know, uh, factors we put on those to cover flaws in the material. And um, for the additive manufactured, um, parts, so um, some OEMs who put a lot of effort and money into this, they found out if we do so, 
and hold all the processes stable, we even don't need a factor like for casting. So it seems to be a good way. This is what we are working uh, on. Um, the green ones are the published standards from SAE. Um, you can just briefly read. You have um, powder specifications, laser powder bit fusion process specifications, they are the 7003, and so on and so forth for different materials. Uh, you have inconel materials, you have um, um, the most advanced one is the titanium um, 64, so it's 90% titanium with a bit aluminum and uh, vanadium. Those are already published, so you can purchase them, and if you want to use of one of those materials, so the strong recommendation from our side is please go into the specifications and try to work along them. Those forthcoming ones um, are these here. Um, so uh, they are still not published, but they will come. So we have, for example, a process specification for the electron beam, powder bed fusion, and so on and so forth. So this uh, is something which you can, uh, where you can take some time and just go through it and uh, make yourself confident to it. The further thing is, we try to give you a bit of guidance. So for that reason, we are tracking the technology. We're trying to get some information to be experienced uh, and not, not, not to say, well, we can't say something on this because we, we don't know anything. We know indeed something on this and uh, in the meantime. So we have issued in April 2017, just one year after our first um, workshop on AM, um, a certification memorandum uh, which doesn't invent something new. It just reminds you what our expectations from regulator side um, which requirements are the most important. And um, I've just marked the red ones there. These are the structures requirement because I'm the structures guy. Um, there are some others. We see the engine requirements. We see propeller requirements. Uh, we see the part 21 and so on and so forth. Those are mentioned there and we have explained why we need those requirements and why you have to bit, put a bit more focus on this and put a bit more effort on this. Uh, under the light of additive manufacturing. And of course, the purpose and scope of this um, guidance is that we would like um, you to, to really um, work on our expectations. Uh, and um, yeah, the next step is to update those because we have uh, those uh, guidance materials because we have realized that there may be some issues I've mentioned before with the non-loaded, non-critical parts. So you may not to, uh, to do the whole 613 paragraph, which you've seen with the uh, statistical values, the A and B values. So that would be a bit overdone, of course. And um, so for you guys, uh, the business has to be uh, going on. And uh, I think so those things, when you classify them as non-critical, um, uh, can be done under a very, let's say, light way of uh, substantiation. And uh, there we would like to issue some guidance in the new update of the uh, CM. Can't tell you a date when it will come out, hopefully next year, <laughs> sometimes. Um, so we will make the approach on the criticality, uh, which I've already mentioned, and uh, yes, and the statistical material properties for them, you may get an exemption for, uh, for non-critical parts and less loaded. Huh? This is the idea behind it. Um, and the last slide from my side is, uh, we will give you also some guidance for the POAs, DOAs, and the MOAs. There's a possible need to increase awareness of closer relationship between those uh, organizations because, there, of course, there is an interference, so we would like to give some guidance on that. And, um, yeah, and, of course, to, to make aware of the existing rules there. And now it's Alex's turn, that was part number one. 
Alex will proceed with part number two. Thank you, Volga. Okay, after you have seen a little bit of uh, technical aspects of additive, uh, additive manufacture, we'll go now through some, uh, some DOA aspects. Um, first of all, I would like to, to show you a short, uh, uh, small statistics. Uh, we uh, did, um, through the DOA team leaders, beginning of this year, a survey. <clears throat> And according to the answers, uh, still a limited number of DOAs are uh, involved in additive manufacturing activities. I've seen uh, earlier when Wolfgang asked you, I've seen a lot of hands in, on the air. But still, <laughs> that might be um, um, not so many DOAs yet involved in uh, additive manufacturing. Um, there is also a large gray part here, so some of you maybe uh, have not uh, uh, yet uh, make up your mind and uh, not provide a feedback uh, to us on, on, on this topic. I will come back at the end uh, with, um, let's say, a recommendation for this. Now, you may ask, how a DOA may start additive manufacturing activities. And I took uh, maybe a, a simple example. Hopefully nobody, nobody will recognize your design data here. Um, but yeah, you want to, uh, to manufacture a part through additive manufacturing, it will be enough to, to say in the notes, for example, that it, this part has to be additive manufactured. Um, Maybe the answer is no. <laughs> so you may need to uh, actually um, refer a process specification for doing this uh, part through additive manufacturing. And uh, you have seen that from, from um, Wolfgang presentation that this process specification is particularly uh, required in some of the CS requirements, some of the airworthiness code requirements. And if this is the case, then obviously your uh, manufacturing uh, specification, your material specification will become part of your type design. And as such, we are expecting a little bit of more elaboration from, uh, from, uh, from the DOA side. Uh, you have seen already uh, the additive manufacturing is depending on a large number of factors. And then depending on the particular application, loaded part, non-loaded part, uh, plastic, uh, metallic, uh, different type of uh, processes involved, you may have to come up with a process specification. And I just want to, to present uh, a few items which might be part of this process specification. Don't take this list as an exhaustive list, it's not. Um, you have to, to, to explain what is the scope, what type of uh, additive manufacturing process you, you are defining, what is the applicability, what, what are the limitations, for example, what kind of parts, what type of parts you may manufacture according to res respective specification. What are the materials? Of course, you will have to refer material specification, but you may have also to add uh, handling requirements for the material, storage requirements, and so on. What is the machine, equipment, and tool used for manufacture, including the machine manufacturer, the type of the machine, calibration, maintenance. Facilities are important as well. The machine environment may impact, um, impact on the result of, uh, of the manufacturing process. And then you have to describe the process. The preparatory work, the printing steps, what are the key parameters, what are the post-processing uh, uh, methods you will apply to the particular um, um, manufacturing process. And of course, you have inspection and test requirements and some PAR markings. Again, the list is not exhaustive, it's just trying to provide you a hint on what kind of topics have to be addressed in a manufacturing process specification. 
You have seen that there are already uh, quite a number of industrial standards uh, available. You may refer in your process specification these standards as applicable. Um, but you may also need, depending on the application uh, you intend to use, uh, the, uh, the additive manufacturing, you may need to qualify the process to demonstrate that the process complies with defined specification and to uh, demonstrate that the parts can be manu manufactured in a um, reproducible way. Um, I want to, to highlight maybe here that this uh, material and process specification are not only part of the type design, but again, answering to some CS requirements, to some aeroroughness requirements, they can be considered also part of your compliance demonstration. And as part of type design, uh, material, uh, the changes in material and process specification are of course subject of changes to type certificate process. Now, I think already Volga mentioned a little bit on, uh, on uh, interfaces between design, production. Uh, there is a clear, clear link. Uh, there are specific uh, aspects you need to, to address in these interfaces like transfer of the, uh, design data, generation of the manufacturing data by the production organization, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, the qualification of the additive manufacturing process. This all is done together with the production organization. And um, yeah, I have seen already, uh, uh, sitting at the table there, I've seen already some of the questions you, you started to ask. We'll have maybe a little bit of time at the end to address some of these questions. But indeed, there are additional challenges if the manufacturing is done under um, maintenance environment and not a production environment. And for, we, are, we are looking to these aspects, and for the moment I would say that uh, uh, manufacturing is not additive manufacturing in a part one for five organization is not, is not possible according to the current rules we have, but we, will, we are looking into, into this aspect. Now, significant change for a design organization or not? Again, depending on the particular ap our applications uh, in which you intend to use additive manufacture, there are quite a number of activities you need to, to develop. And of course, we are, we are looking to, to have these activities perform according to your defined procedure. So you need to have procedures for defining um, process specification, for defining material specification, and for qualifying them as needed. If you don't have such procedures, According to, to the requirements we have in 21A247, we will consider that if you intend to introduce this procedure, it's a significant change to your design assurance system. However, even if you have already these procedures in place for defining uh, process specification, material specification, if you intend to use these procedures first time for additive manufacture, I would encourage you to discuss with your DOA team leader and um, offer, offer us the opportunity to, uh, to, to be next to you when you are starting, uh, starting this um, new activity. Of course, reviewing your uh, significant change for introdu introducing additive manufacturing we'll look to usual, usual topics for, for this, which is type design definition, configuration control, um, how you classify uh, uh, changes, how you um, establish a certification basis, how you use the qualification of the process specific, uh, of the manufacturing process, how, what kind of testing is involved. You may use supplier as well, so we, we need to look to the interface with the suppliers, with the production organization, and to look to the training as well, which is important for a, a relatively new technology which you intend to, to start activities on. Um, we will work 
normally with uh, together with uh, with uh, production uh, with POA team, uh, um, which can be an ASA team or uh, an NA team, depending on the case. Some closure remarks. So I would restate uh, the suggestion, the, the recommendation to contact your DOA team leader and discuss your additive manufacturing intended activities. You may also contact our internal uh, EASA working group uh, uh, on additive manufacturing. You have some contact details there. There are all kinds of discipline structure, propulsion systems, cabin safety, DOA, POA, maintenance cover in this uh, working group. Volga show you some, uh, some of our events which are organizing, uh, organized uh, each year. So I would recommend you to follow these events. They are dedicated events where you can, of course, get more information on this topic. And follow also our, our news, the latest, uh, for example, the latest issue of the J News as a small article on additive manufacturing as well. Thank you. And if we have time, we can probably take a few questions. Yeah, I think we can take a few questions. Some of them that were asked are already answered by your presentation of Wolfgang's, but there are still a number of questions. I don't know whether Wolfgang, you want to start, or Alex, we have some on the um, screen. Yes, I can take one of them. Uh, by the way, um, uh, within the LOI framework, Will there be requirements timeline for additive manufacturer to not be novel anymore in the eyes of EASA? Um, my comment on this is not actually an answer, but it's more, more a comment if you want. Uh, actually, the novelty is not referring to the agency itself. Uh, it's, we, we, we are looking to novelty for the respective DOA, for the respective applicant in the respective project. So novelty may still be there for quite some time. Okay, next one, possibly um, from Erhan. Um, if we request a design part is no structural purpose, just for cosmetic parts. This is what I've tried to explain so that um, there are indeed some cases for non-critical, less loaded parts, like the famous coat hanger or, or um, armrest covers out of plastic where you really have re reduced requirements to, to fulfill. So and this is what we are coming up with in our uh, second issue of the CM. So we will try to give you there some guidance where you have easy certification, let's say, and where it would become a bit more difficult. I think on the other we touch a little bit already. Ah, yeah, there's another one. Um, um, this is from Trevor Jenkins. Um, on process variability. How does the regime for? Yeah, this is the thing. What I've tried to explain as well. So, uh, how you would. Uh, have to produce the data. This is according to the 613, and if you have, you know, first of all, you do a classification. What do you want to manufacture? Critical, less critical, loaded, non-loaded. And due to this classification, uh, you go, possibly, when it's uh, critical into the 613, and you have to do the um, A and B basis. This is explained there as well in the AMC material, so you have to finally to do a lot of samples and show that your process is stable and the material properties have a confidential value of 99%. So that means almost always um, the same properties. Another one um, from Mario Pirozzi. Other than new requirements, are you considering new CRE? Or, well, the CRE will just be uh, taken as a, as a kind of tool to 
to make aware of our CM. So uh, yes, indeed, we, we have Cree for this. We also have a generic Cree already, but I think it's not available on the, well, it's not officially available um, for you all, so you would have to contact EASA first and then uh, involve the Puria certification manager or one of those experts uh, of the AM group and then we can uh, spread this uh, Cree material to you. And that means you would have to describe in, in detail what you want to manufacture, as I said, the classification uh, of the part. And um, then in the Cree will just be written that you have to refer to the existing guidance material, the CM, which is uh, issued already. Okay, maybe one more question due to the time. I don't know who wants to choose one. The first ones, I think, okay. were already yeah. answered. There's one. Uh, may I take this one from uh, Trevor Jenkins as well? So this is about the repeatability. Well, I think it vanished from the list. Uh, the second verse. Yeah, exactly. So what manufacturing process variables are critical to establish repeatability for serious production? This is exactly um, what we try to transfer with the um, standardization material. That means the process specification, the material uh, specifications, which had been worked out by industry and authority in the SAE working group, and by the way, of course, also in the ASTM working groups. So you would have to take those materials, and then you can see what is being considered as most critical um, parameters uh, due to repeatability. The one on deviations and special conditions by additive manufacturing parts on ETSO assemblies. I don't know whether you can answer to that. We can take that question back and, and try to answer it offline. Okay, thanks a lot, Wolfgang and Alexandru. And with that, I would welcome Gilles Garoust to represent the industry views. You know, the, the CECOM is one of the advisory bodies to the agency under the Stakeholder Advisory Board. And uh, we have regular meetings with them. Uh, the next one is actually next week. And industry is, you as industry, globally are our direct partner and it's always good to have also direct feedback from you uh, on achievements, on things that uh, concern you. That's why we asked the CECOM and Jill offered to do the presentation on behalf of the chairman to talk about the advisory board and the CECOM. Thanks, Jill. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. So, uh, good morning, everybody. So, um, those slides are may, may not be as fancy as some others, but uh, I have uh, only a single message you put to pass on, and you will uh, quickly understand it. So, uh, I'm working at DASO, uh, deeply involved in uh, association, trade associations at uh, European, French, and uh, American and international level, and uh, that led me to be part of the uh, ASAB, the Stakeholder Advisory Body Structure, of which I am a, a vice chair. And uh, currently here, when I will speak about the certification committee activities, uh, I will do that as a member of that group. So, uh, so the content is, uh, is uh, they are only 15 uh, slides, so I will explain you uh, where we are today and from where we, uh, we are coming uh, about those uh, advisory body. Uh, I will explain you what are the, the, the basic functioning of uh, the uh, ICB, the stakeholder advisory uh, body uh, structure, so it's at your service. Uh, some highlight on the code of conduct because I would like to stress uh, the fact that those people are working for you and uh, not for uh, the uh, employer. 
or their association. And then I will uh, detail a bit uh, the activities uh, uh, which are undertaken within the certification committee, which is of interest to you. And uh, the other one of interest for you is a design and manufacturing technical committee. Uh, and uh, you will understand why it is of interest for, uh, for you in, within, in this uh, workshop. So the, the legal background, so um, uh, that the law, the basic regulation that requires the management board of the ESA to establish uh, an advisory body. So, and this has visible advisory body has to represent all the interested parties uh, which are uh, uh, under, which have uh, to comply with the uh, regulations, with the European regulations, many of them being uh, prepared by the, uh, by the agency. So, uh, according to the basic regulations, so the management board has uh, made decisions establishing this uh, stakeholder advisory body. I will speak about the um, industry side and, and uh, you will understand that there is also a uh, member, member state uh, side of uh, this advisory body uh, structure. So um, years ago, uh, more, more than four years ago, so uh, uh, in the frame of a management board meeting, we had a discussion about uh, reorganizing, reorganizing the advisory body. So you, you remember that uh, before then, uh, we had uh, an SSCC, which was a safety, uh, safety standard consultative committee. Uh, maybe some of them, of, of few were part of uh, this uh, structure. We had the uh, ESSI, which was the uh, European uh, Safety Strategy Initiative. Uh, and we had also, we, uh, we have also the um, uh, EASA Advisory Board, the EAB. So the idea was to, uh, reshuffle all those groups uh, into a single structure with a better uh, top-down and bottom-up uh, coordination and the possibility when there are issues are identified at the lower level of the advisory structure to, uh, to discuss that uh, with uh, agency directors or to the management board uh, if needed. A key point uh, for all those uh, participant in this uh, advisory structure is to, to make sure the community is aware of what is going on, to be transparent and uh, to be representative uh, of, uh, of a sector. So, uh, just a picture uh, explaining the, those, uh, the structure. So, on one side you have the uh, SAB, the Stakeholder Advisory Body Structure. On top of it you have uh, uh, what we name the SAB plenary. Uh, it's uh, around uh, 35 members representing all sectors. I mean uh, unions, uh, pilot unions, cabin crew unions, uh, air traffic controller unions, uh, uh, commercial operators, uh, air sport, manufacturers, EU, non-EU, uh, maintenance organization, uh, navigation service provider. So it's uh, the whole range of uh, uh, companies uh, involved, uh, well, which have to comply with uh, EASA regulation, are represented there. We have also Aeromedicine, and, uh, and so it's a large list. All that is made public on the EASA website. So below the SAB plenary, uh, we have established uh, a number of uh, committees uh, dealing with uh, specific business. I will uh, detail that uh, on the next slide. Uh, you have to understand that uh, we have the um, industry side of the advisory body under the SAB and there is a similar uh, structure under the member states which is named the MAB for member states advisory body and uh, we, are, we have exchanges uh, between uh, those uh, groups, uh, at the, between SAB groups and uh, MAB uh, groups and uh, with a deep involvement uh, of the ASA uh, people uh, at the level of a director, uh, experts, uh, head of the department, section, etc. And at the bottom of uh, the structure, so you will have all the groups uh, that are established for preparing uh, safety promotion activities, for preparing uh, new rules, uh, performing data analysis. So yes, uh, it was yesterday. So. Uh, no, it was today there was, was a comment made about uh, having an idea of what is going on on other aircraft so that uh, DOA can uh, uh, comply with the, uh, the obligation to take a look at uh, other products of similar design. And so uh, they are uh, groups uh, in this structure, which, is, which are the uh, collaborative analysis group, which are um, maintaining a 
risk portfolio. And uh, I think it's a good entry for uh, any DOA to take a look at uh, so that they can, uh, this, this DOA can discharge uh, the responsibility uh, just reminded um, by uh, France. The structure of the, of the SAB, uh, again, it's uh, the industry side. So on top, you have the plenary, the plenary SAB. Uh, and then you have two, two kinds of um, groups, which are uh, committees or technical committees. So the technical committees, uh, you have a list of four. Uh, one is missing. It's uh, the drone committee. Uh, it was proposed uh, several years ago. Uh, its implementation has been delayed, so maybe uh, the agency uh, is ready now to reconsider its establishment, but we have to address the, the drone uh, aspects as well. So you have the certification committee, for, uh, I will detail it later on. You have a commercial uh, aeroplane safety committee, uh, which is populated with people involved in managing safety in organizations, uh, manufacturers, operators. Uh, uh, pilots, etc. You have the General Aviation Committee uh, and the Rotorcraft Committee. So those, those committees, they have a role, in, uh, let's say, a more strategic uh, role. They, they should look uh, ahead uh, and not uh, just discuss the uh, ongoing uh, rulemaking task uh, just decided or uh, to be uh, close, close to deliver something. This, this, the, the oversight of the, um, the contribution to the rulemaking activities are more on the technical uh, committee side, where you have uh, so a list of uh, five currently uh, dealing with uh, aerodromes, with uh, traffic management and navigation service, dealing with uh, flight standards, uh, dealing with uh, design and manufacturing, and uh, finally dealing with engineering and maintenance activities. So uh, now focus on how, uh, how does it work. So the, um, the SAB, uh, has, um, which is independent uh, uh, to, from the agency, uh, has developed its uh, rule of procedure uh, with some uh, key features which, uh, which are reminded there. So it's about uh, complying with the code of conduct. Uh, ensuring transparency and awareness of the community, uh, agreeing on the position and decision. And, uh, so, and there is a story behind all those uh, topics. Uh, for example, the grid position in the previous setup uh, under the EAB, we had situations where because a single organization was opposing uh, all the others, so the uh, AB, the uh, IAS advisory board, was silent. And so we agreed uh, when preparing the rule of procedure that uh, this cannot uh, happen anymore and that uh, if uh, there is a dissenting view or a minority position, it will be uh, fairly reflected in a position, but there will be a position instead of uh, nothing before. So we have clarified the role of the chairperson, secretariat, uh, contribution of the agency uh, in the uh, functioning of the SAB structure, how meetings uh, should uh, take place, and the working arrangement. And finally, uh, one of the novelty was to re require all those groups to deliver an annual report. Uh, it was never done before. Uh, we have clarified the, the, the distribution of tasks between the miscellaneous uh, SAB groups because you, looking at the slide before, um, going backwards, you can imagine that uh, if uh, there is a, uh, an activity dealing, for example, with the uh, Rotorcraft Committee, it could uh, touch uh, also Fly Standard uh, Technical Committee or the DNM uh, Design and Manufacturing Technical Committee. And so we had to clarify who is leading uh, what uh, activities. There is an escalation process as well in case there is a disagreement uh, at, at, within the group up to the uh, SAB plenary. The code of conduct, a uh, lot of words, I will go quickly, uh, don't worry. So it's about uh, agreeing in a fair manner and ensuring a balance. So uh, we need to balance the safety benefits. Uh, we need to balance the international aspects, the business interests, and the social uh, factors. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a key in the operation of uh, the stakeholder advisory uh, structure. We have to make sure that what is being done is transparent and that uh, the community is aware. And I think we can do better in that respect. Uh, we will work on it uh, 
uh, it's a continuous activity and we have to, to, to perform some uh, progress. Uh, and we have to make sure we are representing the interest of the stakeholders. So this is uh, well, good to say, it's obvious, but um, uh, another uh, item we, we have highlighted in the Code of Conduct is uh, the need for associations which are part of uh, the SAB uh, to, to make sure uh, it's, what is being done does not stay within that association. So they reach out uh, other company uh, for the sector they are representing. And, uh, and also there is some policies. Uh, if uh, somebody uh, is not complying with this obligation, so he, that person can be replaced. So in a nutshell, it's a group, it's a structure, it's not a single group, it's a structure of a group as you have seen. It's formal because it is established under the uh, basic regulation. So it's uh, something uh, that has to, to deliver uh, and it has to exist. So we, we have to make use of uh, this tool which has been provided to us by the legislators through the basic regulation. And uh, they are all at your service. So I've put there the, uh, the, um, the page of the advisory bodies on the agency website. And uh, so you encourage you to take a look at uh, that page. And uh, I've found that we need to, to improve it um, and that will be done quickly. So now, um, <coughs> what is being done within the certification committee and uh, within the, uh, and later within the DNM tech. So uh, certification committee, it has to, say, to stay at high, high level. So we are not discussing a specific uh, rulemaking task uh, unless uh, it's an uh, extremely uh, critical one. So it, the, the CICOM has to make sure the topics are properly uh, handled by the technical committees. And it's a privileged way of interfacing with the uh, certification directorate management. So at each of the, the meetings are, uh, uh, well, we, we have uh, Marcus is attending all those meetings. Uh, uh, Rachel as a certification director is uh, coming at the end of the meeting to understand, uh, to have a summary uh, of the outcome. So it's a privileged way of communication with the management uh, within the certification directorate and it's not limited to the certification directorate when we are discussing uh, digitalization for example uh, the, uh, we have uh, people from the uh, resource uh, and support uh, directorate attending the meeting uh, people from the um, strategy and safety management directorate coming uh, as well so it's uh, it's a tool for uh, you uh, to to address issue at the level of the management uh, within the agency. The membership currently is um, by design uh, limited to, uh, to approval holders uh, for which the agency is a state of design. So it means that they are non, there is no uh, non-EU organization in this committee. Uh, because we have agreed with them that uh, validation uh, aspects of interest uh, through the signatories of bilateral agreements are addressed in another uh, group outside the uh, SAB uh, structure. So the chairman uh, is uh, François Duclos from Airbus and the secretariat is ensured by Xavier Vergès uh, you have seen yesterday. Uh, and uh, we are holding a quarterly meeting. So it's a continuous, uh, they are continuous exchange uh, between uh, this group and the agency management dealing with the certification topics. So what has been uh, discussed in the last uh, cycle? So first, uh, to agree uh, on what are the high level uh, objectives that are shared uh, with the management board and uh, which are also reflected in the uh, IASA uh, document you should have read, which is the uh, European Plan for Aviation Safety. So it's a key document. It has been improved a lot over the, over the years. And it's a document you should uh, take a look at uh, for making sure what is of importance for you is taken into account. If not, uh, then you, you can go, you can ask to the uh, CECOM chairman to take your uh, concern into account and, uh, and then we will use uh, all the SAB system for making sure uh, 
uh, the, your idea is taken into account in the, uh, in the planning of activities with the agency. So we are focusing currently on uh, what is related to safety, what is related to the level playing field, and uh, what is related to uh, efficiency and uh, proportionality as well. So that's, and then from the activities uh, undertaken in the SIC certification committee and all the other ACB groups, the result is uh, an ACB uh, plenary document uh, which is uh, sent to the management board as a list of topics on which we would like to see progress made uh, by the European institutions. We are also uh, obviously uh, talking about international cooperation, so uh, uh, we are discussing uh, and, or, and sometimes we are just informed, but it's the better than nothing, uh, about the progress with uh, bilateral uh, discussion with bilateral agreements with uh, China, Japan, and some other. So it's when, when, when uh, on the industry side we see a need for developing uh, international cooperation, so we go through the CICOM uh, so that the agency uh, is aware of that. Another uh, area of, uh, of uh, interest is the, um, what is related to research and uh, innovation. And uh, you, you may know that uh, currently in Europe, the amount of uh, financing for, safety, for research activity related to aviation safety uh, are very low compared to what the US are doing. And so, uh, I, I mean, it's uh, by a factor of uh, 100. So it's, uh, uh, it's quite significant. And so we are uh, trying together industry associations, uh, the agency, the European Commission, the Parliament to, to, to improve the situation. And, and uh, I think we are, uh, we, there was some progress now. And uh, the role of the uh, IASA in uh, supervising or piloting uh, certain research activities has been recognized and so uh, we are we are doing much better and uh, we we have also have seen that the agency is uh, recognized by the European Commission uh, for uh, controlling uh, certain of uh, those uh, research activities you you may have seen um, a call for tender published on the agency uh, website for example for uh, uh, there was something about uh, rotorcraft uh, 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 crash uh, survivability and things like that. Another topic of uh, interest to all of you is uh, the, the famous uh, better regulation approach, uh, which uh, does not mean that uh, we are expecting less regulations. We just expect uh, a corpus of uh, regulatory texts that are agile enough so that uh, we can develop product uh, or change to product uh, innovative uh, changes and to have uh, those products entering into service. And, and uh, we are lucky, I think, on the product certification side because by the, the tools uh, laid down by the basic regulation allow the agency to tailor the technical regulation you have to comply with when there is some novelty, so we discussed just before the uh, additive manufacturing, so by chance there is no need for changing the regulation, but if there is a need, for example, let's, let's take another example, when, the, uh, when Airbus was, willing, was developing the fly-by-wire control on the Airbus uh, 320, so the, that, that was not at all covered by the regulation, but it was possible to certify such an airplane because we have the special condition mechanism that works, and, and uh, it's fine. But then the issue is, okay, so I have a nice product uh, that can fly down to the ground even if the visibility is extremely poor, but uh, currently you can certify the product, but you cannot operate it because the uh, operational regulations do, do not allow uh, for. So the better regulation is all about that. So, and we, the plenary, uh, the SAB plenary has instructed all the SAB groups to make sure that when there is a rulemaking task uh, being discussed, being designed, uh, to make sure that uh, instructions are given to, to check whether the hard law, the implementing rules are not too detailed on the technical aspects uh, that, uh, and that the uh, guidance material uh, prepared by the agency uh, could not be replaced uh, or uh, developed under a format of an industry uh, standard. 
So that's a good uh, transition with uh, the next uh, key topic is the uh, IASA and uh, industry engagement in the standard making uh, organizations. So in the area of uh, product certification, it's quite common to, to, to refer to uh, standards developed by uh, EuroCAE, uh, SAE, uh, ISTM, now with uh, the new uh, CS23. Uh, and, but there are other areas where we could use uh, standards. Uh, for example, uh, after um, many discussions with the uh, agency, but also uh, the FA, Transport Canada, and ANAC in Brazil. So the industry has organized itself for developing an international standard for uh, implementing SMS in uh, design, uh, manufacturing, and maintenance activities. And, uh, and, and this uh, standard has been developed with an agency involvement, which has uh, allowed the agency to recognize it uh, as uh, an acceptable means of compliance to the regulations which are uh, coming on the matter. Uh, and there are other standards uh, being uh, developed, such as uh, the, the, yesterday we discussed the cybersecurity aspects. So you have understood that there will be uh, requirements on two organizations uh, for dealing with uh, information protection, etc. Uh, I will not redo the same presentation. And, and there is a work uh, within EuroCAE for developing a standard that could support the implementation of, of uh, this regulation applicable to uh, organizations. We discussed previously also the uh, competency and knowledge management, and so we we are, at the CICOM again, we are trying to, to look ahead and uh, we are trying to um, anticipate, uh, for example, LOI that will, that may uh, reduce uh, the knowledge by uh, the agency experts uh, on products uh, being uh, manufactured, delivered. And so that's one of the points we, we have been discussing and we have made proposal and we are testing solutions so that uh, the agency experts uh, are kept in the loop, uh, not in the critical, uh, on the critical path, but they are kept in the loop of the development of a product and how it has been certified so that they keep the knowledge uh, and they are also other uh, exchange about uh, the competency uh, and Stefan with his uh, presentation also was clear on the, on the topic. Digitalization is uh, also taking a, a lot of uh, our time. So what we are talking about is uh, streamlining the exchanges with the IASA. So uh, earlier, uh, when I heard that uh, you are expecting to access uh, in a clearer manner the certification basis of a product for designing a post tc change, this is coming with uh, digitalization. So there are tools uh, the agency is working on. Uh, one is named eRules that may not in the first step deliver the service uh, just expected, but uh, the plan is to deliver it. And so the, the CICOM is a privileged tool for discussing the agency uh, on, on those uh, topics and, um, and uh, much more <laughs> So uh, for the CICOM. Then, uh, quickly, uh, DM Tech. DM Tech is uh, more focused on, uh, on uh, regulations uh, related to product certification, uh, manufacturing, and the organizations behind. So the membership is larger than the CICOM, so they are around, 20, around 25 members from uh, manufacturers, EU, non-EU, uh, from uh, commercial or non-commercial operators, from the training industry, and even from the air sport uh, sector. So the chairman, uh, again, is uh, uh, an Airbus guy, Stéphane Fleury, and the secretariat is ensured by Yuri that you have seen uh, yesterday uh, on, on the scene. So the main mission is um, supporting the, uh, the activities uh, related to the rulemaking task. It's uh, providing uh, inputs, for example, when there are discussion about uh, regulatory impact assessment, uh, about the uh, best in in intervention strategy. So the, the, a group like the DM Tech is uh, a privileged uh, tool for uh, exchanging with the ESA on, on, uh, on those matters. And I think in the discussion we had uh, the feedback from the side meetings 
they are activities uh, or they are actions you are expecting from the ESA system that could be taken on board by the DM tech, uh, such as uh, having a focus exchange on the uh, internal monitoring system. So uh, that's, uh, that's the task the, uh, the DM tech uh, could take on board. The, the term of reference allows uh, the DM tech to, to invite uh, guests for, uh, for a given meeting on a given topic. So I think we have the tool, you have the tool uh, for making sure your concerns are taken into account in the other system without waiting for uh, an annual meeting. And, uh, and they, you will have uh, your representative in uh, such uh, groups that will be able to, to, to track the progress and to have a continuous exchange with the agency for ensuring uh, progress is made uh, between workshops like the one of today. So we um, don't uh, get wrong. Uh, we are not talking only about regulations uh, because it, it has been also clearly understood that uh, there are uh, activities such as safety promotion that could uh, deliver the safety improvement we are expecting. And uh, I think we are all advocates that uh, we do not need regulations uh, when uh, the, 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 the aim can be uh, reached uh, by other tools less, uh, less uh, burdened in some, some cases. Then what they have discussed, so it's an extract from the uh, annual report, so, so again, uh, supported uh, regulatory impact analysis for uh, some uh, specific uh, rulemaking task. Uh, they have contributed to the preliminary impact analysis. They have provided comments on, uh, on uh, uh, rulemaking task uh, being designed, uh, being decided in, in the other preliminary phase before the launching of the activity. Uh, as a reminder, so the DM Tech is a body through which the agency uh, populates the rulemaking groups when there is a rulemaking group with industry involved. So again, it's, uh, it uh, highlights the need for the, such uh, groups to be aware of who is interested in, in what. And a uh, key topic, I speak again about the, the IPAS, it's um, the European Plan for Aviation Safety. So we are using the ACB structure as a bottom-up uh, tool for making sure the IPAS uh, is addressing the concerns from the stakeholders. And that's all. So I'm saving some time for the lunch. So if you have any questions. Thanks, Jill. We got a few questions, but I guess some of them are already answered, but maybe you can go through them. It's not that many. I think well, the, the first one is, uh, uh, I was surprised not to find uh, the minutes of the meeting on the agency website, because by uh, the term of reference, the minutes of the meeting should be published. So the list of representatives is uh, already on the website. Uh, if you go on the page I have uh, given the address, you will uh, find an Excel file. Uh, well, currently it's a PDF uh, version of an Excel file where you have all the members of all the groups within the SAB structure. So they are not the email address, uh, but I will um, check with uh, SAB plenary and the other whether we could have at least the email address of uh, the chairman and of the secretary of uh, those groups. So, and uh, we, we have to make sure we are publishing the minutes of meeting as expected by the rule of procedure. So, a discussion to come with, um, with the agency. Uh, yes, the IRST holder, so um, in the in the CICOM for sure, uh, it's, uh, I have seen him, it's uh, Andreas, so he's, he's uh, there uh, for representing the after uh, market uh, business and, uh, and he's a valuable contributor and, uh, and uh, we will meet uh, next week again uh, during the CICOM. In the ARCOM, I don't know, but uh, Mario, I think you are in the ARCOM, you could tell us whether they are a STC company. Mario Pierdi, no? I don't see, he left? Already uh, back to, 
Meeting his wife. Okay. Bon. Uh, bon. okay. <laughs> uh, Super Mario has left. Okay. Uh, um, the the with the SICOM follow up. Uh, yes, that's the, the proposal I made. Uh, not only the SICOM, but uh, well, we will distribute uh, the actions uh, between the SICOM, the DM Tech, and maybe some other groups. But I think it's. Uh, uh, the outcome of the workshop are very valuable, so I think they are of interest to the agency directly. They are interest to interest of interest for the SAV, and uh, we will take them uh, on board and uh, for making sure there is a progress in between. And um, what are the other industry partners, members of SAV? So the FA is not part of the SAV. So the SAV is a is a European body established by the basic regulation and uh, so there is no FA in the SAB plenary. SAB, FA could be involved in uh, rulemaking activities uh, but not in the, um, in the SAB bodies uh, and in the SAB bodies so again so they are representative from it's a very very large they are more than uh, 200 uh, names uh, working in uh, those groups coming from a variety of companies, so uh, small, uh, large, so it's uh, manufacturers, operators, uh, we have general aviation uh, business, maintenance organization, so it, but it's, that's why they are uh, 200 names, and uh, if you take a look at the file I was talking about uh, with the membership, it's organized by groups, you have the sectors, so the, the, the groups are structured by sectors, so we are asking for a given sector, let's say manufacturers, to have uh, five representatives in a group, to have commercial operators with uh, five representatives, to have uh, unions, uh, ten representatives, it depends on the subject, and then uh, the, in this sector they, they are several associations, and they have to provide uh, the number of uh, names with alternate uh, that are uh, required according to the group uh, composition. So they are many industry partners and uh, I will encourage you to reach out for the uh, chairman of those groups when you have concerns. It's again, it's a tool at your disposal. It's a privileged tool, it's an established structure, it, it is formal because established under the basic regulation, so just use it, it's uh, for you. Thanks, Gilles, and I think uh, that was a very important message, that structure established under the SAV is there for you to establish a means for you to raise your points, why are the members so it's all very formal because it's established under the base regulation. And uh, please look at the website and the link that uh, G provided. There you will find all the details. And if you have questions, you get also in the slides the names of the chairmen from the CECOM or the DM Tech. Uh, but I think it was a good point and a good question whether the topics raised during this conference can also be followed up by these bodies. And, and as Gilles said, uh, some are mainly in the DM Tech area, some maybe more for the CECOM, but we will have to discuss how we will address it. And I think it was a good approach and, and we will follow that up. Okay, with that, thanks very much to all of you for the morning session. We can close it and break for lunch. Please be back on time at 1.30. Thank you.
Okay, can you please take your seats? We would like to continue. Okay, I know it's difficult after lunch and you would rather prefer to sleep and digest than to follow a presentation. Um, the next one is on EASA's involvement in the development of industry standards. And on the agenda you will find Massimo Mazzoletti as presenter. Unfortunately, Massimo got sick and Alain will, was kindly accepting. offering and accepting to do the presentation on Massimo's behalf. So, Alain, please. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have the privilege uh, and the honor, I would say, to try to keep you awake after the lunch, and it will be, I hope, uh, achieved soon. And for the shiny presentation, I want to mention something. You have to wait for the next one on innovation, new technology, and so forth. So I try to keep the two as entertaining as possible. And also for this one on the standard industry, how do we, as I involve ourselves into this, uh, it is interesting to see that as this morning we spoke about competence, we spoke about knowledge, we spoke about SICOM, uh, a, a common point to all of that is most of the time we do not know what partners, stakeholders are doing. And here, what I would like to do today on behalf of my colleagues is to introduce to you what do we in NIASA do to better support uh, standards development in general and, of course, industry standards in the design world uh, as specifically. You will see that we have an interesting organization. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Some may not be familiar. I would like also to invite to join me uh, Chris Misiak, who is one of the key players into this group. He is the one who designed the tool I will present to you very soon on how to manage our priorities into this uh, management body. So, in a nutshell, what I will introduce to you is this internal, international standard committee within YASA. Well, the title is a bit strange, internal, international. You will understand why in a few minutes. It's because we are tackling both aspects, internal coordination and international uh, <coughs> participation. So, we go forward. So, this presentation, very quickly, what are the objectives and the scope of this committee? Uh, how do we organize ourselves? That's why you will see that we have put in place a, a, a quite solid organization. It can always be improved, of course, and streamlined. But given the constraints, given the environment, I think we've achieved today a certain level of maturity, which, of course, based on your feedback, can always be improved. What were, very quickly, the outcome in 2020, 20, 28, sorry, 2018 and 2019? And then, of course, the most interesting part of the presentation uh, we have some issues, we have some topics on which we could work better jointly. Again, this presentation is not Yaza, how do we work internally, is Yaza, how do we organize ourselves in order to better work with you. And in order to better work with you, we need to make sure that you also on your side, industry side, if I may say, you organize yourselves as well as you can. 
and you will see the last slide, a couple of recommendations. Nothing, no rocket science, common sense, but sometimes you will know very well common sense is the most difficult aspect to implement. So, the scope of this uh, committee. Basically, we have four parts, uh, starting with the one we are not tackling into this committee, Jarus. It's, it's quite simple to explain why aren't we tackling Jarus into this committee, dealing with standards and international cooperation. It is because we work mainly with Eurocai and other European committees and organizations, and, and therefore, for this specific committee, it has been a wise decision not to include it in here, because in terms of management, it would be a bit complicated. Then we are coming to the real uh, living parts, IKO groups and panels, standardization body, and that's what I would like to focus on today, and cooperation with the US, Iraq, AIRC, very familiar to you, how to make sure that we remain harmonized. Alors, it is very important to have this kind of structured approach into our system, because we have some specific agency vision and strategic objectives, which you may be familiar with, they are published, and of course, we have finite resources, as much as you have, and we have to make sure that what we decide to work on will be really something we have to work on based on our strategic objectives. Alors, in particular, the, the various uh, recurrent topics today are, of course, we spoke about them already yesterday and this morning, CS23, ASTM 44F committee and so forth, VTOL, we cannot speak about standards without talking about VTOL, of course, eVTOL, a lot of work is coming to us and we have to organize ourselves. On the harmonization with the US side, it's also an important aspect, this Iraq IRC. Uh, I will mention a group very close to my heart, sorry, I'm still a pilot, so I try to favor a bit the flying aspects, the Flight Test Harmonization Working Group. This was created years ago into this harmonization forum and has led to significant ARC and Iraq work on really topics which are of prime importance to you, industry, and to us, safety regulator. Typical examples, toll prevention, upset recovery, flight control, flight load, fly by wire, and so forth. We cannot afford not being present in this kind of business. So that's why, from a management perspective, we have to make sure that we have somewhere in the agency a group managing and streamlining and pushing for those various tasks. Whoops, I was too fast, sorry. But nothing new here, so that's basically what I explained. Uh, an important point, we are mainly here design, manufacturing industry. Standards are heavily, really heavily used into the ATM world. And we learned a lot from them. When this uh, committee was created, that's now about five, six years ago, uh, the, the real initiation of this business was into those standards into this way of standardizing activity with industry and stakeholders. So, nothing really new here. We try to have key topics, so international cooperation, ICAO, FAA, and other really key partners, standardization bodies, and when we are doing this, normally we are able to support you as best as we can. Very quickly, into this IIAC, so you see how it is organized. Uh, from day one until last month, uh, Pascal Medal was the uh, chair of this group, the chief engineer, so in charge of all uh, aspects cross directorate into the agency. Uh, Pascal has got some more tasks and he has handed over the chairmanship of the group to Massimo, who unfortunately has got the flu, as we said earlier on, I'm here on his behalf. So Massimo is the new chair of this group and he's taking care of safety strategic objectives, so it makes sense. And below you have a number of uh, staff of directorates participants. All agency directorates are participating at management level into this uh, decision body. So this IISC, uh, this standardization committee, is really the key group in the agency cross-directorate, no silo effect, nothing, it is really cross-directorate, having the privilege to work on all standardization, international and ICAO tasks to be performed for our common benefit. Alors, moving on to the specific standardization body activities. 
which are what we are interested in today. So the right hand side of, uh, of the table here. You see that we cannot be everywhere first. The list here is not exhaustive. Huh? As we said, there are many more bodies, but we had to focus our involvement into those bodies where we have or we anticipate major uh, benefit and major efficiency gain for common uh, activities. So EUROK, RTCA, SAE, ASD STAN, a number of uh, representatives are in the room so that they can complement as necessary ETSI, IETA, and ASTM 44, of course. Chris, if you have comments and do not hesitate to, uh, to interfere, you are welcome. <coughs> I knew he would have a suggestion on the next one. Hello. Good. So how do we work in the agency? And how do we set priorities? Uh, I will start first with a recurrent comment I hear from some of you in the room that why aren't you present here? Why shouldn't you do this? Why don't you go there and so forth? because we have to abide by some objectives, some priorities, and we have to establish in the most neutral and objective manner possible those priorities. So any proposal, any working group activity is coming to the IISC, and the IISC, according to a number of criteria, will assess the priorities. And the way to assess priorities is now followed, following a quite structured process. It's, uh, it's quite stable and strong in terms of priority, prioritization tool establishment, and Chris was the one who initially developed this tool. We have found seven criteria that are listed here. Is it strategic, sensitive? Does it relate to a safety issue? Do we have an harmonization uh, issue? I spoke about my flight test harmonization working group, for instance. It is a typical high-level harmonization issue. New and novel technologies uh, work at a request because we have some specific direct needs from the agency and so forth. Chris, maybe a few words on the priorities. How does it work? So, uh, first, uh, I just want to thank uh, Alain for the opportunity to speak to you today. And uh, he was very kind in his introduction. Uh, it's not just me. Uh, behind this is a group of people who are working to make sure that the agency's objectives are being fulfilled through our activities on the standards bodies and in the ICAO activities. Um, and what we are trying to do is make sure that the agency's resources are being targeted and funneled to the most important standards uh, uh, where we have interest according to these criteria. So um, we have, uh, in the previous slide, you saw the organization, and I'll speak towards standards, it's what I know best. We have a, a similar structure on ICAO. On the standard side, we have the involvement of our chief experts who are responsible for specific domains, and they are making sure that the strategic criteria are being fulfilled for our involvement on in different activities. Um, so it's not just an individual from EASA participating here, but we want to make sure it's the agency's objectives being representative in the standards and the development of the technical standards that all of you are familiar with. Um, and I just want to point out again that we've got a team of people working on this and we are coordinating our efforts so that at the agency level, uh, we're not working at cross purposes. Many thanks, Chris. So this we can scroll up. Now oh, that's interesting. Whoops, what do we do in practice? Uh, we are on the executive uh, council or technical committee of the seven key uh, standardization body. What is in red here on, those, uh, on, on this slide are the groups, the standardization body in which we are at council level. So we are the highest possible level. That means in the EUROK, SIE, ASD STAN, we really have common strategic decisions in between the standardization body and the agency. And in terms of common prioritization of activities, this is essential. There, is, there are so many things going on around us. There are so many initiatives that we need together, you, industry, and us, we need really to, ch to challenge first what's coming to us and to set common priorities. And when you are at this council level, since we have a voting right, you can heavily influence the way to go one direction or the other. At the end of the day, it is to favor the consensus. The key word here is to achieve consensus in order to be more efficient in the real world when we will make use of those standards for certification purpose. 
So you see here, uh, Pascal is at the European Council. Uh, in the European TAC, you have Friedelm and Mr. Brian Jolie and a few others, chief expert colleague in the SIE and the ASD stand. So voting rights are really important to us. If we have no voting right, well, we are observers. And then, uh, the, uh, if I use the word from your side, the return on investment may be limited. Because as observer, if we something we are not happy with, we can comment. We can say, be careful. You, we can mention some reservations. At the end of the day, we have no say. Bon. So that's not the most efficient way to work. When we are officially in an activity, when we are really contributing, that's a different story. And I see uh, some colleagues here from ASD stand. Uh, you may agree or disagree. Uh, <laughs> I would say partly you agree, probably. But when we have real empowered agency contribution to a working group, this is, this is beneficial to you and to us. Because in the end, we can take over your standard when they are found acceptable to us. Sometimes we may agree to disagree. And we have recent cases where, sorry, what you developed was not good enough to us in terms of safety regulator constraints. So no, this we cannot take full credit. But there are many cases where we can take full credit. So this is work under construction. And of course, there are many other working groups here. What you see, sorry for the acronyms, these are uh, EU uh, coordination group for ATM, for unmanned aircraft, for cybersecurity. Uh, a, a lot of groups are developing around us. Uh, I would not say proliferation because it has a negative uh, connotation, but in a way, there are a lot of groups generated and sometimes competing, you will see later. And we have to make sure that jointly, we can work on it. Alors, a, a specific word on the last bullet, the, the FAS. What is this FAS UAS? It is the Forum for uh, Aeronautical Software. And in this forum, they met last week in the agency, so I'm quite familiar with what they've done. They are working on critical software development for the future, talking about COTS, talking about D178C, ED892, and so forth, and how to pave the way for new technology implementation. So the first UAS was generated for UAS because UAS world, they are permanently challenging, are well established, uh, historical structure. They need to have more agile models. So the FAS was really developed into this mindset. And uh, believe it or not, what we saw is that now, after the first uh, brainstorming, sometimes lovely brainstorming into this uh, forum, uh, new ideas are developing. And talking, for instance, about COTS, uh, they are working not only for UAS benefit, in fact, but they are working for the whole aviation industry benefit. So that's why I wanted to mention this one in particular. There is a real uh, common interest here to invest time and effort into this kind of group, as long as we know that they are uh, meeting our strategic visions and objectives. Bon, a few, I will not go through them. All one by one, huh? we are just the last afternoon, right after lunch, so I don't want to bother you with this. You will see when you will get the hands out, quite impressive list of achievements or key contributions here. Uh, again, uh, what is important, you will find all over the presentations, all over the discussions, UAS, uh, General Aviation, Part 21 Light, and so forth. It is coming back regularly. So this is tackled under all possibilities under all entry points, be it at part 21, Michael yesterday talked a lot about it, or standardization bodies contribution. And we are quite happy with what you saw, with what we saw here, in particular, how to coordinate with ASTM. CS23, you saw yesterday, Amendment 5, is basically implementing this ASTM standard for GA. So we have to make sure that in terms of advisory material, we are still able to manage commonly the development within ASTM. So under the IISC, we also uh, manage, monitor, I would not say control because it's a bit uh, an oversight, but we are monitoring what is going on to make sure that our safety regulatory objectives and constraints are still met. It is nice to declare, I implement a standard, now, on the long term, it is like initial certification on continued worthiness, and coming back to this morning, we have to make sure that the initial assumptions are still met afterwards. So, 
We agree with the standard at a given time. How does the standard develop? We have to make sure that it develops according to our common safety objectives. As a safety regulator, it is still our prime objective. Alors, no surprise, uh, that was before the achievement of the con key contributions. Now the priorities we had for this year, exactly what I said, huh? and it will still be for 2020 with a few ads on, but clearly within your CAE, a main effort is going on into the GA domain, into the VTOL. We are also experimenting a pilot case for the lean processes with your CAE, how to streamline development of standards, how to be a bit faster in terms of uh, time to delivery, and the VTOL uh, AMC is used as the pilot case to test this lean uh, standardization development. So that's work under construction. It is clearly a priority for the, uh, for the agency. Uh, you're okay. The, the, the light aspect is becoming more, impor, impor, more and more important. We spoke about part 21 light, but more globally, we have to talk about proportionality. You will see in my next presentation on the innovation, new technology, there are clearly newcomers. They have to have something different from what we are used to do. If not, we, and that would be a pity, we will kill them. The business model, the business case will do, would not survive. So proportionality becomes really one of the drivers for all of our tasks. The main criticism we heard before, uh, uh, Yaza, you have been working for Airbus or Boeing and you had a kind of top down and the SMEs were really under heavy, heavy load. I hope, feedback will tell us of course, but I hope we are improving dramatically this. We had various initiatives, the GA task force and so forth, this proportionality, this uh, 21 light, M light and so. So we really tried to develop new approaches to our work, still with a safety regulator objective in mind, therefore with the safety objectives, but with different processes in order to be more streamlined, not to say efficient, but to be lighter. That means commensurate to the industry needs. So that's the first one. ATM, bon, we are here mostly, I would say, manufacturing. I do not think there are many ATM uh, or ANSP uh, participants into the room here, but be aware, be informed, we are heavily involved into the ATM discussion for all kinds of good reasons. Uh, we are having also, as you know very well, a lot of discussions, a lot of activities on new space on how to create a new environment. So ATM is also in terms of interoperability and future development, data link, ed 92 c and so forth is really a top priority for the agency in order to better support not really your segment of industry, but the one allowing you to operate into a safe airspace. Hello, that's what is, I do, I have to do a bit of advertisement for my colleagues, as Chris mentioned, uh, there is what we call the IIAC, it is a management body, a management group into the agency with a number of participants. But in terms of practical involvement, in terms of expert involvement into activities, uh, in 2018, we were directly contributing to 150 working groups in standardization body. I'm not sure everyone in the room is aware of this effort. This means that we are trying to monitor, to handle, and to manage, thanks to our uh, prioritization tool and so forth, a lot of activities. And this means that with our finite resources and budget, we were able to allocate last year uh, for those uh, working groups about 7,770, so almost 8,000 working hours, only for standardization bodies. Well, it may, not, it may not look very much for you, but uh, for us, in terms of direct involvement into this long-term uh, investment, it's not negligible, to say the least. And this year, 2019, we are about 15,000 working hours, which means close to being between nine and three full-time equivalent. So you could say that on a daily basis in the agency, we have close to 10 staff members permanently working on standardization bodies activities. It's for the management, for ourselves in the agency. When we run the analysis, we knew it was quite a lot, but when we got the 2017, 18, 19 results, we really saw a growing tendency and we are quite uh, pleased by the developments. And as you know very well, we are moving uh, into a 
performance-based environment, risk-based, performance-based, we want to make more use of standardization uh, of standards, sorry. So clearly, if we want to make more use of standards, we have to be more present. And that's what you see here in terms of direct contribution. We have 15, so 15,000 working hours, and in the agency, we have 165 focal points for a given standardization activity task. So it's quite a lot. And this needs to be properly managed because at the end of the day, what we want to make sure is that when we send someone for an activity, we, that means you and us, get something out of it. You expect that we will accept your standards. Normally, that's the expected deliverable. And we expect that this standard will meet our objectives and will be useful to the two stakeholders. So we have a common interest here to make sure that those 15,000 towers, those 165 focal points are properly uh, managed into the positive way in order to ensure that we're efficient together. And now comes the interesting part. To achieve Coming back to what I said before here, to make sure we can make a good use of those 15,000 towers, we need a bit of your help. You will understand why. What we see today, and uh, you can feel it already from what I said before, we see a really fragmented European standardization body landscape. There are a lot of overlaps, and sometimes, I would say I'm diplomatically correct here, it results in some loss of efficiency. Uh, and that's a finding. It is not negative, it's normal life. There are so many things going on, so many activities to be managed. There is this kind of uh, proliferation, as we said before, of activities. And this fragmented landscape, if we, uh, and again, we, together, industry and us, do not manage it properly, and at the end of the day, you and us won't be happy with the result. So, since it is fragmented, it is becoming for us more and more difficult to involve ourselves into the right activities. It is quite a challenge. Uh, we saw, uh, we start to work on the 2020 uh, program for next year. I have to be honest, I have still not fully understood the complete picture. I'm part of the IRC as well. It is not because we don't have any time, it is because we have a lot of redundancies, a lot of overlap sometimes, and that's what is really dangerous for you and for us. For us, because we run the risk to agree on something which we disagree next door, we may again bless it there and disagree there, so it's not efficient. And for you, because you will be, at the end of the day, heavily frustrated if we are not able to take credit of a given standard at a given time when we were heavily involved into its development. So, in a nutshell, the last bullet is unfortunately uh, very relevant to, to nowadays. It may prevent recognition and visibility at international level. Our European landscape is probably not the most or the strongest one we could dream about. We could jointly probably do a bit better. So that's the conclusion that uh, Pascal Medal, as the last six years uh, IIC chairman, uh, raised and insists upon, and that I fully make mine as well. We have, you have, sorry, your industry all together, because standards are your ownership, not ours, and we are supporting you. Uh, you have to check the system because we speak at the end of the day about industry standards. So, and even better, European industry standards. So, my main recommendation to you on behalf of all my colleagues is you saw what we have today. In the agency, we have a lot of willing people, good experts, ready to work with you. But we will work efficiently with you only if we manage the vision, the objectives, and the deliverables jointly. That's the main recommendation, the, the main uh, dream from us in the agency. If we want to use more industry standards in the future, and we want, and it is Patrick key vision, and we have started to implement it in many domains. If we want to make more use of industry standards, we have to make sure that we foster common effort and common directions without having too many uh, alternative ways. So, in a nutshell, that's what I had to introduce to you on behalf of uh, my IISC colleagues. Chris, any additional comments you would like to make? 
Are you fully happy with the start of the prioritization exercise for next year? We are not obliged to answer the question. But I, I stop joking here. Uh, really, uh, this last couple of slides, those last couple of slides, are for us the, the main points on which we have to work together. And we are prepared to support industry to be a bit less fragmented. But it is not our decision. Industry standards are industry standards. And that's why you first have to check the system as industry uh, key stakeholders to make sure that, as uh, we said here with Pascal and Massimo, help yourself to help us. And in fact, we are missing half of the sentence. It's not only help yourself to help us, but then it will be for us to help you even better. And with this, I would like to say thank you all. And if you have any questions, let's try to address them. Thank you. Well, we got a few questions on I don't know whether you can answer to them directly or maybe Chris can support, I don't know. Oh, well, there are quite a few here. The first one would be for you, Marcus, in fact. Huh? <laughs> you were expecting the reply, I'm pretty sure. Hello, in the meantime, I'll the other one. So, hi, uh, is there a roadmap for recognition of AMC good practices of ASD DOA think tank released pre end series? I think Chiro may help here as well. If, if we are not, uh, we'll take note and we'll come back to you. This, this is work under construction. Uh, I know that there are a lot of discussions. Uh, maybe, Patrick, uh, you can help us uh, to answer this one because I'm sure it's coming uh, from your, uh, your neighbour here. So well, we have a system in place where we comment and support on these documents. I'm not quite sure what you mean with a roadmap for recognition. You mean a formal process that these things are automatically or not automatically, but uh, acknowledged by EASA for certain things. OK, that's something to be discussed, how we could set that up. Now, there is another one below. Why create your OK versions of RTCA document? Well, in fact, I would revert the question to you because uh, Eurokai is the European uh, standardization body. So indeed, sometimes we have to maybe rely on others. But as European standardization body, I would say I am the, the least best person to answer the question. It should come from uh, the one having decided to do so. That means the European standardization body. Alors, how do we call Alors, Maybe one comment on that. If you look at DO 160 versus ED 14, they are very old documents. And at that time, a lot of these documents, whether it was this one or others were just, they were not working together like we used to do now. And I think that explains why some of these documents exist, even though they are identical. Now, in, in the same spirit, what we see today, uh, we want to make more and more use of your okay to support us or to support you in developing new standards. We spoke about VTOL before, advisory material to our special conditions and so forth. Uh, we, we are tasking, if I may say, nowadays, not back to the future in the past, as Marcus mentioned for the others, we are really trying to task more and more those standardization bodies. But the issue is that we are only one player among many. So we have to make sure that within the Council, this reaches a majority and this agreed to be a priority. Hello. Mm -hmm. Which? Oui. Yep. Go ahead. Just a, one more comment on the RTCA and Eurokai connection. You're probably aware that to the extent possible, when a new standard is going to be developed, they try to have them done in parallel paths. So the documents, the standard will finally be released by both organizations at the same time, and the committees doing the work are coordinating the development of that performance standard. That's the objective, the goal. So there's no cross-purpose, there's concurrent development, and the standards should be equivalent. In the past, maybe it didn't happen, but that's really the goal that we're trying to, to enforce. As Alain said, when we are having uh, one of our EASA staff sitting on the Eurokai Council, that's one of our goals, and we also try to enforce that through our participation on the Technical Advisory Committee at Eurokai as well. Oh, thanks, and that's a very good point because uh, the, the FAS, uh, so the Forum for Aeronautical Software I mentioned before, 
is a common Yorkai <coughs> art, sorry, <coughs> RTCA uh, working group. So that's typically what Chris was describing, even more, because it is this time integrated. And they will work not only on codes and other issues, but they will work on the DO178C and so forth, so really on topic of common interest. So today, since a few years, really this is an important remark, thanks a lot, Chris. We try to foster common effort, and, and it has worked pretty well. Now we need to do the same within Europe, among the various bodies. These two historical, let's say, big players, RTCA, EuroCA, uh, SAE also, uh, we have very well, I would say, established connections. So it is relatively easy to, to anticipate and to know what's going on. So now within our internal landscape, I will not start with all of the bodies which are in place, but then we have to make sure that we can do the same in terms of channeling common efforts. That's, that's our most challenging task for, for, uh, for the next years, let's say. And new business model anyway will fix it because you will have to take actions. Okay, maybe one of the two questions. I don't know whether you can answer on the AS9116, whether you know that detail. I guess we have to come back no. offline. Okay. Oh, we, take, we take note and we'll come back on it, yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks, Alain. Thanks, Chris. So many thanks, Chris. And Alain has the pleasure and the fun to talk now about innovation and related activities. Or since I'm still an aerobatic, very active pilot, the, the, last, the previous one was the uh, freestyle unknown presentation, if I may say, using the uh, terminology we are using. This one is the known program now. The shiny, the entertaining one, and what I wanted to mention, we are frequently joking with Marcus, uh, this is the, the shiny bit, but that's not a joke, in fact. That's the way to prepare the future innovation and related activities within the agency. It is not only certification. Here you will see, I will start from the top and then go to the various uh, directorates. So how do we prepare ourselves for the uh, new challenges? Early last year, Patrick Key decided really to, to show and to act on how to prepare the future within the agencies. And we have entered since, let's say, almost two years now, a, a series of changes to, to be prepared for the future. That's what we have here on the bottom right. It is not a joke. We need to transform the agency in terms of mindset, how to work with industry, how to be prepared for new challenges, new business models, new technologies. This is no joke. Yesterday we spoke about digital transformation, we spoke about additive manufacturing this morning and so forth. The list is endless, clearly. So we have to put in place into our uh, historical uh, organization, and there is nothing wrong because we have years, decades of very good records together with you. We have to put in place a parallel stream to prepare the future. Now that's what uh, Patrick Key started to develop uh, last year in creating what we call this innovation cell. So what is this animal? This is a, a cross-directorate activity. It's a cross-directorate group. Uh, with representative from flight standard, from safety strategy, from certification, really uh, a small group at management level able to sit down, brainstorm on what are the new commerce, what are the new priorities, what are the challenges we have to work with, how to prepare new competencies and so forth. So the, the key the, the, the key vision here is adapt the agency to innovation. It is to create a dynamic of innovation within the agency. But also most important, we spoke, uh, Stefan, you spoke about it this morning, competence, how to make sure competence is shared within an organization. It is our challenge. So here, how to share innovation knowledge. We have a lot of experts who are working on very fascinating topics. We have to to gather this knowledge, those sum of competencies for the benefit of all. So that's really what we have here. Collecting, sharing knowledge and information across domains is vital to our efficient development. And most important, because we are not working in isolation, 
This innovation cell is to make sure that we support you best. That means support the industry on innovations through new means, new tools. Your vision from the agency some years ago was a safety regulator. You are here to produce something, to design something, to develop. We are here to assess and verify that it was right, to summarize. We are not here to work with you as partners on common challenges. What we are targeting now, still having this safety regulator, of course, core business uh, as main business, what we are targeting is to work with you also on preparing the future. In fact, the we need to be prepared for the future is not we agency. It is we together, you and us. And that's the last uh, bullet here on, the, on this slide, to support industry on innovation through various partnerships. And I will show you which kind of partnership we are having. But before, just to show you how did we organize the agency. Uh, Jean-Marc Cluzo, who is the lead of uh, the innovation cell, has developed uh, an innovation network it is, uh, of course, a community tool on our uh, website. And uh, since we are talking about new technology, we have to use up-to-date uh, communication tools. And this network has uh, had a slow start. And since a few months, really, now you see a lot of experts exchanging, sharing ideas, views, brainstorming, without, I would say, any taboo on not additive manufacturing, because uh, we hear about it every day, but about, about other topics, uh, AI, about neural network, and so forth, in a very open manner. And it is amazing for a safety regulator to see what kind of information we get into this network. So we are really keen, uh, together with Jean-Marc and colleagues, we are really keen having this network, because it's a way to to, to get our experts into a new or different communication mode. You don't talk about innovation through emails. Uh, it does not go very far. You have really to exchange. It's a forum, in fact. Well, that's how we work internally. Well, the objective is quite simple, as we have here. It's to foster the knowledge community. It's really a community, a mindset. <coughs> It's also to, to encourage what we call the cross-directorate and cross-domain collaboration. We all have the same issue in two our respective organizations. We have, I will not use the key words, dangerous one, silos, but we have domains. And sometimes domains would have a tendency to work a bit in isolation. For innovation, this should be prevented by all means. We cannot have a domain innovative next to a domain non-innovative. That is nonsense. So we have to make sure that across all domains, we are able to speak openly, share views, and in fact, don't feel to be ashamed or to don't, don't be afraid to, to, to mention something which may look a bit strange to your colleagues. Just a way to have new ideas on new topics, and maybe out of 10 uh, posts, one will be very interesting. And the experience shows it's working pretty well. And we also organize inside the agency a number of uh, other events, uh, lunchtime lecture, uh, all staff meeting, and so forth, really to develop this new spirit, this new mindset. So, how to work with you, industry, because that's what you're interested in, in fact. So, I can speak here on behalf of Jean-Marc Clouseau. Huh? We have basically two major tools in the agency. At executive level, we are working on what we call a memorandum of cooperation. It is really a high-level agreement between executives which gives all of us, you and us, a vision on what we want to commonly develop. A cooperation on whatsoever, AI, a cooperation on drones, I don't know, a buzzword of today, so it can be the case. So how to work between industry, one stakeholder, and us. This will set up the scene at strategic executive level, and then for us, we can implement this vision into various, uh, various means. So in particular, what we call, that's the first uh, sub-bullet in yellow, huh, what we call innovation partnership contracts. That's a very new animal into our landscape. Well, not so new anymore, because it's more than a year already old. Uh, we have quite a few, some are already completed. I cannot disclose anything about them, of course, because this is innovative, so there are some IPR you will understand. But what I can really uh, comment, based on my own experience, because I was part of most of them, is uh, it is a way to, to drive our experts for the next step. They are still experts from certification, from uh, flight crew, from ops, etc. 
But here we have to sit in a room with sometimes a startup with brilliant, bright ideas, very disturbing to us as a safety regulator if we focus, if we stick to our Part 21 uh, mindset. So the question when we launch negotiation for those IPCs is not, it is more how to make it happen. And just a small uh, anecdote, if I may say, uh, at the very early stage of those IPCs, I was in a meeting with a, a lot of people, and it was amazing. It was pure coincidence. We had the one presenting, and we had a group of experts, another group of experts, and the presentation, uh, presentation was fascinating. It was really something uh, quite interesting. And on the right-hand side, I had people who said, ah, it will never work. Oh, okay, then. And on the left side, okay, that's difficult. How can we make it happen? And I'm not joking. It was, it was really the case. It was amazing the way people were distributed. The right hand side, we have to drive them through the next, uh, I would say, mindset. And on the left, they were already convinced how to make this happen. It's not easy. We are not prepared. What can we do? And that's what we expect in terms of common benefit, in terms of achievements together with you. So the first one is to, to drive all of us through this innovative mindset. That means we should be in a brainstorming mode, how to make something happen. Of course, again, I have to put the caveat, we are a safety regulator, so we are targeting certain safety levels, that's clear. But uh, clearly here, alongside this main objective, the other one is for you and for us to learn from each other, to develop I will not say our knowledge or competencies, but really to develop our common understanding, sometimes common knowledge, on a given high-tech topic. For additive manufacturing, now it's quite uh, on track, but I spoke about neural network, for instance, in the agency some years ago, there were not so many people familiar with neural network. Today, we have developed a certain knowledge, I will not say competence, but thanks to a number of discussions uh, in that respect, we have developed a certain culture on neural network. It's just a simple, uh, modest example, but it shows you the benefit of this kind of uh, approach. And of course, we have many other tools, uh, workshop, research cooperation, exchange of experts with industry. Yes, that's something very important. We want to develop exchange of experts, sending some of our experts to you and vice versa. Again, to exchange knowledge, not only technical, sometimes it can be processes as well. Well, in, in certification, just to do a bit of advertisement for Rachel's uh, directorate, we had also gone last year through uh, a significant reorganization, and you will find into this new organizational chart all keywords in general aviation, in uh, so CT2, uh, second from the left, in CT3, VTOL, for instance, you have eVTOL and new concepts. This is really something new, how to prepare the future. In uh, general aviation, you have light and manned, and, uh, sorry, light, manned, and unmanned uh, aircraft. Again, here, a lot of work with the next uh, neighbor department on drones, on all those new systems, and many different ones. I have also to mention something. It is not really innovation, but it will facilitate definitely innovation. In the city 4 uh, department, you have a, a new word, sustainability. Again, here, in the new commission environment, into the new European mindset, we have to keep this in mind and we have to make sure that what we do is sustainable on the long term. So this is something new. It looks simple in terms of organization, but in terms of mindset, in terms of how we manage our experts, it is quite significant. And I should not forget the most important one, of course, my new position here eh, at senior level, which is to make innovation visible uh, and to organize it for the directorate. So, I spoke about the partnership a few seconds ago. Basically, that's what we are looking for. And uh, we get more and more contact with you, so it shows it starts to, to really become a, a, a workable tool. We want really to work on this supply of technical knowledge, but basically not only addressing novel technologies, but also new business models, as well as new services. And new business models in the new entrants they are quite sometimes challenging business model to what we do. So this is part of what we have in mind here. It is not using our uh, usual word, the shiny, high-tech, uh, visible part of the system, but it is equally, not to say even more important, those new business models that are the enablers for the, the high-tech development. So we are also prepared to work on this. 
And to conclude here, a very important caveat, uh, we had historical tool, the TAC, uh, Technical Advice Contract. Uh, this has nothing to do with innovation. TAC is really short term. You have a certification program just about to start. Your design is already well developed, well frozen. You want to have a specific advice on some doubts you may have on this program, then we can talk about the TAC. But this is really pre very standard certification work. If you talk about the feasibility of something new, a proof of concept, a really new challenging model, then we can go for an IPC because that's what is really important. So we have the, the graduation, the memorandum, the executive vision, the, the mission statement for the organizations, how to work together, and then below various tools. And the most important tool, experience sh starts to show it, is this IPC, Innovation Partnership Contract. So if you have any idea here, do not hesitate to contact Jean-Marc Clouseau or anybody else from the Innovation Cell. We will be very pleased to tell you more about how we are working on this. Alors, now, uh, we were into a design and certification DOA prod uh, production uh, workshop. We have not seen many aircraft. You saw one yesterday uh, during Michael's presentation. So, I have a couple of slides now to show you the challenge we are faced with. This, for us, is easy business. It's a daily business. We are very well prepared for years, for decades. We know how to certify this. So, we could say, historically, no problem. This is a bit more challenging already. That's what we have today on our plate. Uh, you may be familiar with some of them. Uh, uh, the, the top left is, is quite interesting, the uh, PAL-V. The PAL-V is a gyro, so good say, but it's not very innovative, but it is also a car. And so that's something which is challenging because they will have, or they should have to comply, to, com to comply, sorry, not to complain, to comply with uh, aeronautical standards and road standards, and sometimes they are not very compatible. More than electric car, uh, the Stratobus, uh, and so forth, the Lilium, which you know very well, the Aeromobile, and many others. But I, I took a few examples here to show you. Yesterday, very well established structures, CS23, 25, 27, and so forth. Today, on top of the previous one, this one. So already here, quite challenging, but then, what we may see, what we may see, I'm not joking, huh? these are contacts we had, this kind of products, or even this kind of product. Maybe one or two out of those 30 here will survive, or maybe five or 10, but in any case, we have to be prepared for the future. This kind of product, you may be familiar with some, some are flying, huh? some are already, uh, I saw some video, I even was invited once to, to visit one, uh, I have not yet found the time to go, but I'm sure I will find the time. I'm quite keen to see how the, for instance, the Terra Fujia or some others are really flying in practice. So this is no joke. Some models here are quite challenging to our uh, engineer and uh, pilot uh, mindset, but they are not even more challenging than the one, for instance, the, uh, the Volocopter or the Lilium, which are already flying today. So, in a nutshell, to complete uh, this uh, presentation on innovation, what do we do here? The key word, the starting point was last year, so as I mentioned, creation of this innovation cell by Patrick Key, and this innovation cell has shown to be a good support to all direct right into the agency to, to prepare ourselves for the future. And with this, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Alain. And because of these pictures, you know why he has the most fun job in certification, doing all these nice things. Uh, we received one question for you, which is not really something on innovation, <laughs> but it's an interesting connection. Uh -huh. That's a good one. Uh, bon, it's, uh, we, we could speak for ages about that. We, we have in place what we call the, a continuous process improvement. I will use the quality wording uh, just to make sure that we are on the same, uh, uh, on the same page. Bon. Now, what, what we are doing today, uh, and it was part of the presentation in fact, it is not only about new technology, it is also new business model and how to, to get the agency to be better prepared for the future. So, 
in terms of certification process, well, you, you had the first idea by Michael yesterday. We are really shaking our regulatory system, the PER21 lights, the GA task force. What we call also, nobody has mentioned it, but the net safety benefit. That's a very interesting concept. For a regulator, uh, for a lawyer also, it is a bit challenging. A net safety benefit is you are not considering the full set of certification specification, but you are having an assessment of the end-to-end -end safety benefit. Will this system, I'm very uh, black and white here, will this system, for instance, save more life than it will cost? Uh, it's a bit simplified. But this net safety benefit is for us also a way to allow innovation to implement system which may not comply with uh, 1309 at the latest amendment or uh, do 178 b and so forth, but which will be of so much help to the pilot or to the crew that the relief will be huge. And the overall net safety benefit will be very positive. So all these kind of initiatives are addressing this question, how to improve our certification process Definitely, uh, we are on the way. Not only through streamlining the processes, being more efficient, you know that we have an efficiency project in the agency, how to work in a more streamlined into a more lean uh, process, but also in terms of new mindset. And maybe I'm wrong, but I think the mindset is even more important than the process at our expert level. People have to be really prepared to, to work with you on how to make something happen of course, into a given framework. And the given framework, we have to agree on it commonly. And that's going back to the previous presentation on standards. We have to make sure that the standard is mutually acceptable. And then once we have this, we may work with a new mindset, how to make it happen a bit better. But still, historically, uh, like any change, uh, any transformation, still you will see, uh, I will use the word, the legacy of the standard pro products for years, uh, probably decades. So we have to have two systems, one roaming down and one roaming up to, to handle them. And that's what we're working on. Hello, I may, I may address this one, yes. Uh, we, we are, and uh, here I speak on behalf of uh, Luc Tidgat, who is the director on the safety strategy, is working really a lot on uh, developing network with universities and also research institutes. We are, next week I will be in DLR, for instance, for, uh, for a workshop with most of the German researchers. DLR organized next door to us here an event internal and we will participate uh, with the DLR management on explaining what we do, what is certification, what are the safety objectives, why do we need a certification, and, and that's what we are doing here. Bon, I will not go through the full list because uh, it, will, it would be a bit boring, but I can guarantee you we have a lot of direct contact even some memorandum of cooperation with a number of research institutes. Uh, Luc Tidgat, Jean-Marc Clouseau also are working with universities on developing also uh, PhD programs. All that is process uh, under development and we are very hopeful that it will uh, soon produce the, the first, uh, the first uh, result. And I wanted to comment on the last uh, bullet here. This may impact uh, issue of competence, definitely, and that's why we want to work with them. For us, IPCs, more contribution to research, more involvement into university studies, which are very close to research most of the time, PhD programs, all of that are tools to develop our competence and to remain either on top or at least to know what is going on in order to, in order to be better prepared for the future and to identify also the necessary needs for let's say recruitment or transformation of staff for the next decade. And here with the CECOM, uh, which was presented this morning, we have regular discussion on what are, based on industry feedback, the, the most important targets for us as a regulator to focus our expertise in terms of transformation or in terms of development. Okay, thanks a lot, Anna, on the update on innovation. And that brings us to the general question and answer session. And as promised yesterday, uh, we will address some of the questions that were raised yesterday in the various sessions uh, and couldn't be answered due to time constraints. And I would like to ask Michael Gerhard to join me here on the panel.
And I will start with already some. We got not all colleagues here yet to respond back to you directly, but they provided us uh, with their responses. Starting with cybersecurity, for example, uh, there was a question whether cybersecurity measures have to be considered during development of equipment, software processes, which are classified with dull E or dull D. And you cannot really link it only to dull E or dull D, because if the system creating a bridge between aircraft systems with higher integrity uh, and system impact, eventually you have to assess it in terms of security risk, and you could be required uh, to do and introduce cybersecurity measures even for these. But that really depends on the assessment of the impact. Then there was a question whether we have recommendations for DOAs how to perform a cybersecurity assessment uh, if interfacing with an existing uh, OEM aircraft network system. Uh, and there, there's some document from EuroK ED203A, uh, which tells you more or less that you have to, prior to every modification, uh, you have to determine the interrela uh, interrelationship between the modification and the previous modification, so the type actually, up on security and averseness. So that is, I think, clear that you have to consider all the elements when you want to do a, a change. Um, and if you, by analysis of the modification, determine that there is no impact, uh, then the scope of the classification can be limited to the modified area or components and you don't have to do a complete uh, review. Just one more. Inter Any plan to rely on industry standards, and that fits perfectly well to the presentation from, from Alain, as AMC guidance material for part AISS, and to which extent? Yes, we plan to rely more on industry standards. The work for that is in progress to identify them, and uh, if there are additional gaps that we identify, we might do a dedicated AMC material, but otherwise uh, we could introduce existing industry standards as AMC and guidance material. And then there was a question on how do we on, all on cybersecurity coordinate with other authorities, for example the FAA. Um, and there is a rulemaking task 648 and the text of, of this rulemaking task is the result, for example, of an ARAC uh, from report from the FAA, and we are closely uh, working together with the FAA on these tasks to align it as much as possible. Michael, maybe a few comments on rulemaking, because I think there were quite a number of questions. Yes. So on my first presentation on part 21, there were a couple of unanswered questions. Um, for example, what will happen when a design organization is not finished with the implementation of LOI on time? Um, I believe, I hope we had mentioned that. Uh, if not, um, the answer is that uh, we will issue a level two finding. Um, then there was the question on the relation between um, the presentation that we've made on part 21 light and the rulemaking task 727. So rulemaking task 727, uh, the name is implementation of the new basic regulation into part 21. And the ideas, the concept uh, presented to you yesterday by Bodewin Dois is part of that rulemaking task. So you will find all the considerations on this issue under the rulemaking task 727. But also other aspects like non-installed equipment, engine aircraft interface, all of that we will handle under this rulemaking activity. Um, and then uh, maybe also to build a link between two presentations you have heard yesterday, um, there was in the morning uh, the question 
following my presentation on part 21, uh, is there a way EASA collects feedback on EASA's um, SMEs, so subject matter experts for the sake of LOI? Yes, it is, uh, and that is the tool that in the afternoon yesterday was presented to you uh, by Andrea. I think uh, for part 21, these were the main questions for the presentation on uh, part 21 light. So uh, the presentation from Baudouin, um, there was a question, how does ELA1 and ELA2 uh, fit within the part 21 light concept? ELA1 and ELA2 today in part 21 is a means to insert proportionality in part 21. So we will have to consider whether we use these uh, differentiators also for the part 21 light concept, but this will definitely not be the only ones. So we have to see whether we also use these criteria uh, in part 21 light or whether we go for other uh, classes and criteria to differentiate. A very important one, um, we didn't mention the date. Uh, one of you asked when is the next workshop to discuss the concept for part 21 light. This is actually organized uh, in about three weeks uh, on the 18th of December. So, as I mentioned on, in my presentation, if any of you is interested to contribute, to share your thoughts with us, uh, please let us know and we are going to invite you for that workshop. 18th of December. Would Part 21 light apply to light drones or drones always, are drones always considered complex? Um, yes, uh, as mentioned by Baudouin, the idea is to use the Part 21 light concept for conventional designs. So drones and other people also ask about VTOL, for example, um, they will not fall into the Part 21 light concept. Can an aircraft initially be covered by a declared restricted certificate of averseness and be subsequently covered by a Part 21 light TC and C of A? Also that we are discussing. Uh, that should be possible. Um, we, will, uh, we are still discussing the concept for that, but yes, uh, it should be possible. I think these are the most important ones on part 21 light. Um, actually, the most questions we received on uh, my presentation, our presentation on non-installed equipment, um, and here I would like to summarize maybe three uh, main topics um, that came up repetitively. So almost half of the questions that you have asked was uh, whether specific equipment um, falls within uh, our ideas of certifying them as non-installed as non equipment. Um, you mentioned life preserver, um, hospital medical equipment, luggage uh, carried by the crew. Uh, cabin flashlights. So, as mentioned, we will have to define categories, we will have to make an impact assessment, we have to demonstrate that there is a safety benefit of certifying, but at this stage uh, we are not yet able to say yes or no to a certain uh, piece of equipment. Another question that was, uh, or questions that were uh, asked in a uh, repetitive manner was in relation how the process, uh, certification process for non-installed equipment will look like. Uh, and also here, um, I have to uh, ask for your patience. We st just started to develop the concept. We wanted to share with you the initial ideas of what we have to regulate and in which direction it may go, um, but we are not yet ready in a position to explain and to discuss with you um, the process. As mentioned, we will do that uh, already before the NPA through some uh, consultations with stakeholders uh, as soon as we have the first concept. Maybe a bit like we are doing now for the GA proportionality for Part 21 light uh, through the, some kind of workshops. And also an important question that came up a couple of times in respect of non-installed equipment was uh, whether non-installed equipment certified here in Europe 
uh, will be accepted uh, by our bilateral partners and to what, what extent uh, the certification of non-installed equipment is being discussed with the bilateral partners and also whether there is an idea of harmonization in the future. And we have actually started uh, this discussion uh, with especially the FAA, TCCA, uh, but also ANAC. Uh, in December, again, we will have that on the agenda of a meeting we are going to have with them on rulemaking topics. So yes, uh, we do discuss with them uh, that is an important aspect uh, if we introduce this new animal, like I named it yesterday, uh, in our legal framework. And then, uh, on our last presentation in the afternoon on part 26, uh, there were three uh, open comments. Uh, the first one was uh, currently the air ops regulation calls out part 26 only for commercial air transport, but the new regulation uh, 133 from this year applies also to non-commercial large aeroplanes. Is there a need to update either the ops regulation or the part 26 regulation? Uh, no, there is not. Uh, the two apply in parallel. Uh, in the OPS regulation, you will find on two occasions a reference that when an aircraft enters into service, it also has to comply with the Part 26 regulation. And then in Part 26, you will find all the requirements for aircrafts which are operated already, so not only for those ones which enter into service. Um, and then in Part 26, it is specified who has to cl comply with it and uh, which kind of aircraft have to comply with it. You saw yesterday a couple of examples. Most of the examples uh, that we've shown to you apply to all large aeroplanes. But there were two examples that only apply to large aeroplanes in commercial air transport. You will find in the future in Part 26 requirements specifically for helicopter. So, in part 26, in every paragraph there, it's specified who has to comply with it, the operator or the TC holder, and what kind of aircraft um, or which kind of aircraft has to comply with it. And then two questions that I would like to treat together. Um, does the structural integrity, uh, sorry, no, uh, does the structural integrity uh, change overlaps and complements the impact of AMC 2020? So that was in relation to the aging aircraft rulemaking task. Um, it does overlap, and as part of that rulemaking task, we are also reviewing uh, AMC 2020. Once the regulation is adopted and entered into force, we will issue an agency decision uh, to amend AMC 2020 to bring them in line. And then, will there be a Part 26 compliance of any major repairs that may have been accomplished previously? So, repair assessment to comply with the DTA requirements, uh, also re in relation to the aging aircraft. And yes, also that will be specifically uh, a specific requirement in the future Part 26 requirements if they are adopted as proposed by EASA, that there's an, uh, a mandate to re uh, review existing repairs uh, in respect to their fatigue critical structure, uh, but only for aeroplanes with a passenger capacity seating of more than 30 persons. I think these were the most important ones, uh, and then uh, we may reply to the other ones in writing. Thanks, Michael. And we have a few more uh, on other topics. On, on DOA, we had quite a number of questions on the dashboard and making the performance rating more transparent. And yes, we will do that. As said before, we have the meeting with industry, the CECOM, next week, where we will share in detail uh, the performance rating from PCMs and experts, for example, and this will be then made available to industry uh, globally. Why, but we will discuss it and present it first to the CECOM, so we will make it more transparent. And you can also later on uh, potentially check with your DOA team leader to get the uh, criteria for, that we use for the assessment. Um, there was a question related to LOI applications and whether that impacts the progress on new initial DOA investigations. Uh, well, I would say initial investigations are stretched over, let's say, nine months up to two years. And, and the LOI uh, change, significant changes, will be much shorter. So eventually there could be one or, for one or the other case an impact, but normally I would say due to the long time nature of an initial investigation, 
there shouldn't be too much impact on this. Um, and then another question on the uh, dashboard and one of the topics. Um, the question was, if there is no level two finding during this concern cycle or, or year, uh, how is that then evaluated in the dashboard? Well, if you have uh, no finding or no overdue finding, then you get the score for, uh, which is 100, so the maximum, the best score. I think that's, that's pretty obvious. And another question was whether DOAs can use the same or similar dashboard for the internal assessment. Yes, certainly you can, can use it. Um, you can duplicate the rating system, uh, taking into account the same criteria, sure. That's uh, up to you how you want to do that. And then we had some questions on the international bit, especially on the uh, bilateral with China. The one question was, whether we consider it a kind of trial period process for projects with China. And I think it was pretty obvious that the technical roadmap and the so-called track two projects, which some of them were presented uh, during the presentation from Schaal, uh, were exactly that, a trial process to get familiar with the system of CAC and also for them to get more familiar with our system. So yes, this was actually done. Um, another question for STCs considered as, as administrative validation. Is it acceptable to EASA that non-STC holders, so third parties, can request validation such as aircraft operators in China? And the, the answer is the Chinese authority will only issue the approval to the original STC holder. So you cannot as a third party ask uh, for validation of an STC you are not the owner of. And I think that's pretty normal business. It shouldn't be different with China than with any other country. Um, some of the questions, I think they were already uh, answered, like has the BASA with China, is it in force yet? No, it has been signed, but the official exchange of diplomatic notes, etc., needs to be ratified with each party. This process is still pending and we are waiting with that in, in the coming months. So in 2020, I think we will see that it will be in force. Um, will any preliminary information be available on the other CAC tip, like expected coverage? As this is all under current discussion uh, and we haven't agreed on certain positions, uh, we cannot disclose any information on, on these details yet. As soon as the TIP is agreed and signed, uh, then the information will be made available like for any other on the other website. But it would be a bit premature when we discuss among authorities the topics uh, to release drafts or even ideas uh, that are not really discussed at a certain stage among the authorities to, to share that uh, with, with everybody else beforehand. And few other things, we received a number of questions to the same topic and we will take it from here to see which of these topics are worth to add an article, for example, in the J News to address these things, uh, that everybody has the same information. Uh, and as I said, and Michael, you mentioned it as well, we have a number of topics that were repeatedly raised, slightly different worded, but in essence covering the same subject. And we will try to follow on on these and potentially come up with either FAQs on the website or eventually an article in the J News. And with that, I think I would close this session. We have one question that we received via Slido. Can the next workshop coincide with the Christmas market, please? <laughs> well, I have some good and some bad news for you. Um, yes, it can. But the dates that we have penciled in tentatively for the workshop is 16th and 17th of December. 
it's still, I think, manageable. You will have less missions normally during that period of the year. The week after is a normal working week, so I think it should still be possible. And as mentioned also by some, it will be Wednesday, Thursday, that traveling is much better also because on the side meetings will be on a Tuesday. But this is all tentatively, we have to confirm that, but at least um, I know that Christmas market over the years was very popular uh, with all of you, and we try to secure that for next year. But it's quite difficult we, because we checked already a few weeks ago for next year and to getting a room that can host around 500 people, uh, it's rather difficult and, and we are quite lucky that we at least were able to secure this. Okay, thanks for the inf uh, session here. And then it's time, I think, to come to the wrap up. And I'm quite glad that Patrick could make it in time to do the closing remarks of this workshop. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to see such a, such a, such a big audience. It's uh, the most popular of our uh, workshops, and uh, I, I would really like to congratulate uh, you for this. Initially, indeed, I thought that it was because uh, of the Christmas market, but uh, then I was told that the Christmas market starts next week. So. Uh, it's not for the Christmas market, but it's for the, the, the topic of those discussions, and I, I would really thank you for your interest. Um, the format seems to be interesting for you as well, as it is interesting for us. Uh, side meetings where uh, you can um, talk together, ch share best practices, talk about common issues, and then report back to us. I think that's uh, something which is very interesting because at the end of the day, I hope that uh, this workshop is useful for, for you, but it is also very useful for us to get your direct feedback on a number of the topics that we saw uh, and, and also your impressions on uh, how, how, how good we are, we are doing our job and um, how we are um, uh, working together with you. Of course, um, not everything is positive uh, in your feedback, which is normal. And uh, I think we, we make a good note of uh, some of your remarks. Uh, for instance, uh, on rulemaking, uh, on part 21, uh, we, have the, we are conscious that uh, it's a lot of changes which are happening. Uh, and that uh, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it can be a bit difficult to keep track of uh, all the, the changes which are taking place. And, that's something that we need to take on board. Uh, we um, were criticized a lot in the past for producing too many rules and not being able to explain them enough. Uh, this is something that, uh, on which I think we have made some progress uh, in the past years, but we still can continue to make progress. So thank you for, for your, your, uh, your feedback on this. We will try to do our best to still improve our performance on this. Um, on the rules themselves, we also hear your feedback that uh, we need to be more proportionate, uh, not to over-regulate, which is all, always the tendency of uh, rule-making officers. Uh, you know, they are there to make rules, basically. So uh, if they don't make rules, they don't have a job. Uh, and I can understand that uh, you know, they always try to make uh, new rules. Um, but um, um, we, we try to, uh, to, to, to be more proportionate uh, to listen to you, uh, and this workshop is very important for this purpose as well, to also help us uh, in our drafting of new rules uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and trying to be more proportionate and, and do things which are uh, fitting to the needs of the industry. Um, 
your feedback also on the need to improve the way in which we inform you, so not necessarily one, only once a year in this uh, workshop, but uh, continuously when there are changes, when there are new things arriving. This is something that uh, in EASA we are, we are thinking about more globally, uh, you know, how we communicate with our, our stakeholders, with our stakeholders' community. Uh, it may make some sense uh, to create a dedicated DOA community, uh, I leave it uh, to, to you, uh, for which uh, we would have a dedicated communication channel and this is really something that uh, we need to improve and that we are working on. And so just, just all of those things to, to give you some examples of um, uh, the comments, requests that you, um, that you voiced to us and which uh, are, are duly taken into account and which are already, I think, part of our strategy. More on the... On the, on, the, on the philosophical aspects, if I may, of DOA. Um, I, I was, uh, until this morning in Berlin, uh, at, a, at a conference organized by IATA, and there were a lot of journalists, and inevitably there, there were questions about uh, the Boeing 737 MAX, um, and questions about the notion of delegation to industry. You know, you know that uh, VFA has been accused, uh, and there were a, a lot of uh, uh, remarks on uh, the, um, uh, the way in which VFA delegates to uh, or delegated to Boeing. And a lot of the questions that I had yesterday, uh, that uh, we have had with Rachel, <laughs> with uh, Marcus, and our colleagues uh, in the past six months, is: uh, Can you explain to us? Uh, if in Europe you are not over delegating to the industry and if you are retaining your full role as a um, certification authority. And our answer has been at all the, in all those instances to say that we have a system in Europe which is the DOA system which is quite different from the US system but we believe that the DOA system in Europe works very well. And that the formalism, the, the methodological um, processes that we are using in order to use the DOA and for the DOA to use your privileges, we think is working very well and is having the right share of responsibilities, accountabilities, between the certifi certification authority and the industry. This doesn't mean to say that uh, we cannot improve it uh, and that we cannot review it. Uh, the implementation of the LOI um, regulation is a, uh, just a good example of that. But I think we have a very robust system in Europe with the DOA. And I would like to, to thank you for this because I, I I made some uh, conferences, I participated to conferences in uh, other regions of the world, such as in China, where I, I, I was asked to explain what the DOA system means. And my point to them was, it takes two parties to make it work. Yes, there is the formal, for, form, formal part of it, the regulations, the EASA part of it, but there is also the industry part of it. And we cannot reach a good level of uh, relationship, a sound level of safety assessment, if we are not on the same wavelength and if we are not at the same level of maturity. And for this, I would really like to thank you because um, without your commitment without your involvement, including in sessions such as in the last two days to make the system live, we would not be successful and uh, I would really like to, to thank you for this. So, um, just to, to finish, um, I, I, I consider that um, you know, safety is never a question of um, uh, uh, an agency saying your system is safe. It's always a question of partnership. We are working together in order to make it as safe as possible. 
And this DOA relationship is, I think, the best illustration of this partnership. And these two days of workshop, I think, have shown, at least to us, I hope to you as well, that uh, this partnership is alive and kicking and that uh, we are making it work and we are making efforts to make it work even better. So I would like to thank you again for joining, uh, joining us here in Cologne. Um, sorry for the Christmas market, but uh, next, uh, next year uh, you will be able to, uh, to do shopping. I hope that you won't uh, be more in the Christmas, ma Christmas market than in this room, but that's, uh, uh, we will see. Um, by the way, uh, you can prepare for a much higher cost for the hotel, because that's also the weakness of the Christmas market season, which is that the hotels are much more expensive. But uh, that you will discover when uh, you will make the hotel reservations. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your attendance, and I wish you all a safe travel back home. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick, for the nice words. Uh, before you all go back home, uh, I would like to thank a few colleagues who really made this event so successful and who worked behind the scenes, organizing and upfront, chasing people, uh, and who really made the conference the success that it was. So we had Andrea Kalski Baumann and Philip Brook from EASA, who more or less organized all of this these two days. Uh, Albert Herando and Joao Lafuente, who supported us here on stage and up there with the slides. Emma Piruges and Christina Toles from my team, who organized the side meetings. And I can tell you, it was a lot of work to get that together, uh, to collect all the input and, and to organize this. And then we had Maud from Keiko Forma, who were in charge of the and supporting us and organizing this. So I would ask you to give them a special applause because they worked very hard for this. Okay, and with that, I close this conference for this year and I wish you all a good trip home, a good Christmas time, and see you then in the future.